Hello. Welcome to True Choose Leicester. Thanks to you all for coming. Um, today's format, basically, we, the talk's going to be in two sections. We're going to have a small break in the middle, uh, we'll have a little break at the end, and then questions and answers at the end. Um, but if anyone does have any questions throughout the talk, just put your hand up, we'll pass this radio mic round. Uh, John's up for answering any questions as he goes, so uh, we're just going to do it like that. So I'll pass you over to the man who really needs no introduction. Welcome everyone, it's John Harris. showed me a world till I was seven years old of pure love, compassion, benevolence, everything wonderful that human beings have and we possess. My dad died when I was seven and my world turned literally upside down and I suddenly realised that the world is not this wonderful, loving place and that people were horrible and they would say horrible things, do horrible things to you. Um, that manifested into mental issues, that I, I was abused, um, finally resulting at 14 years old spending a year in an asylum, so you do realise you are listening to someone who spent a year in an asylum. So everything I say, bear that in mind, please. <laughs> I'm not on medication anymore. Well, I am. But it's of my own choosing, and uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but so my world, I, I got to the point of actually hurting myself on purpose to get the kindness out of human beings. Now that's a really, really sad state of affairs when you're sort of eight or nine years old and you will physically hurt yourself just so human beings will be kind to you because I missed the kindness that my dad had shown me. I missed him horrendously. I really did. My, my, my family history is, is, is a very interesting history that I'm still delving into. And on the 28th of this month, I've got the pleasure of speaking in Penzance, literally yards from where I was born, on the mountain, in Penzance Bay, Marazon. And that is going to probably be one of the most interesting talks I ever do because it's more about a fact-finding mission for me than it is for me to tell them things. The Cornish people hold a, 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 hold a secret that has never been, most of the Cornish people don't even know that this thing exists, which is even more fascinating. And what I do find fascinating as well, the distract slightly, is everywhere I go around this island, the Scottish, the Welsh, the English, the Cornish, I don't know a great deal about Ireland. I, I, I feel that Ireland should be a country in its own right. Well, not a country, because it's a political regime, which I'll explain later on. But we should have no interference at all. They should be able to do things how they see fit. They should, uh, they, I've always had that. I've always held that notion. 
But I go and talk to, to the Scottish and I talk about their history and they don't even know their own history. And I talk to the Welsh and the Welsh don't know their own history. And I find this absolutely amazing because history holds keys. It holds fascinating um, information that if you actually look at it properly, it's not bullshit. It's not all crap, it's not all, you know, oh yeah, it's right by the victim. Yeah, it is right by the victim because they're boasting about things. And when you see it as being boasted, what are they boasting about? And that's what caught my eye, was the boasts. Why are they boasting? Why, why are they so, you know, why does, why, why are people so, um, got hooked up on books like the Bible, which to me is a fictitious storybook, with fictitious characters in it, the same as the prophecy of Shun is a fictitious book. All right, it's about a character supposedly who lived in Egypt 3,000 years ago called Akhenata. But it's still fiction. I haven't studied Egypt. I don't know where to start, to be honest with you. But I was looking for things that I didn't even know I was looking for. And that is the most fascinating thing. And this all comes, this all stems from my my dad, because I'm looking for the kindness in human beings. I still look for it to this day. I won't hurt myself deliberately to get the kindness. I now realise that I can do that in language. I can speak to people in a certain way, and the kindness comes out. It doesn't matter what costume they're wearing. And they are all costumes. It is a bit of a pain of mine. But it's, it's my approach, it's my manner, that solves problems, not my aggressiveness or my anger. And I realise that. You can make very poignant points very bluntly, but you can do it politely. You can really do it politely. There is no excuse to raise a hand to another human being. There is no excuse or no reason that is valid to feel the need to scream at another human and, and cause them mental abuse, because it is mental abuse. There is no reason. I don't see a reason for that. I'll never accept there is a reason. And the very fact that we do accept that these reasons do exist is the very fact why we live in the world we live in, because of this. So I wanted to look at things and go, hold on a minute. So I went out and I was talking to gentlemen like Brian Gerrish, I was talking to lots of other people that you would recognise and others you won't. And they were saying to me, oh, you're really intelligent, you're this, you're and I'm not, I'm a simpleton. I am a really, really simple man at heart. And I'm not intelligent at all. I'm, I, I'm, yesterday I was laying on oak floor, an engineered oak, shit, but it was an oak floor at the end of the day. And I've just fitted the kitchen for someone, and she's a school teacher, and she's coming to one of the talks, which is really cool, because you're asking me some very poignant questions, because she has already. And so I'm a tradesman, my van's parked outside, it's full of tools. Don't drop my van, please. <laughs> I've got my work on Monday. <laughs> but I'm, that's what I am, I'm just a tradesman. I'm just a, a, an everyday work, work, working class guy. I am honest to the core, I refuse to lie. And I get in trouble with my partner, I get in trouble with my family, I get in trouble with my friends, because I won't lie. And we don't like the truth, we don't like the honest truth of what we've become. We really don't like it. It's ugly. They call it the ugly truth. You look in the mirror and you realise what we have become. We live in a fucking paradise. What have we done to it? We do. Can you dispute that fact? I've, I, I've never had the, the, the pleasure of going to other parts of the world. The furthest I've been is Belgium to work in the steelworks, and that one of the prettiest places I've ever been. <laughs> that's about it. That's as far as I've travelled. Belgium. Shallow water, actually. But I've been around this island, and we live in a most beautiful place. We really do. But we seem to forget all that. Why do we forget it? Because we're distracted. And why are we distracted? We're distracted because when we have distractions such as these things, and I'm just as bad, just as bad as anybody else on computers. We don't look at things a different way. 
So anyway, I, I, I did a very small talk down in Top, uh, down in Top Ness, and I had a big piece of paper behind me. Brian Gerrish, as far as I know, I still got it to this day. And on this piece of paper, which is about eight foot long, and about six foot wide, is every king and queen, every pope, and every law I could muster, I could find out about, is written on this piece of paper. And at the time, we had a husky. Pain in the arse, that dog. Lovely dog, pain in the arse. And we said, I'm stood on this piece of paper, and he stood on it with his dirty paws, because he's just been outside. And I'm looking down, and I looked at my partner, who was just sat to the left of me, and I said, Do you know what? I can see it. I had to see it in one thing. When I was doing things on the computer, I've got a piece of paper here, a piece of paper there, a piece of paper here, I've got a computer screen there, I might have a laptop over here. I couldn't work it out. It was, it was all, it was, it, it, it puzzled me. But when I could see it as one thing, and I could actually start to go, well, I'm going to look at it, and I was drawing lines across it, and I was, hold on, that happens. And he was there, then he was there and there, then it was like, I see a pattern, I see a repeat, there's something repetitive about this. And I was looking at 800 years of history, obviously very key parts of it, not all of it, but I was starting to work out, so, oh, and there's something, and I started to work out there's, there's, there's these differences. There are certain members of society who have privileges, and there's certain members, and a lot of members of society, that don't have privileges. What is this society thing? What is this, what's law? Why is there, why can I see three different types of law? All different types of, you know, and they're all working different ways, but they work in parallel to each other. And they convert from one to the other, and they jump. I was down in London Thursday night. I don't know if you've ever been down in London, been in the city. Have you ever been walk around a city? It's a fascinating place to walk around. I must admit, it really is fascinating. Have you seen the High Courts of Justice? Have you seen this building? It looks like something out of fucking Disney. <laughs> it looks like the Disney Palace. I might stood there, I was with my mate Rich, we were going to go to talk at Shoreditch. So I'm looking at it going, because it's all lit up. Fucking hell. It looks like Disney. And then we walk past this one section, I said, fuck me, there's a church. And it literally looks like a cathedral. When you look at it properly, and you look at the big artworks, and all the stoneworks and everything, you look at it, it looks like. And it's really interesting because if I suggest anything about the church, everyone says, oh no, it's not going to bleep on about that again, is he? And oh, oh no. But you don't realise. You don't realise because if you look at history and you look at this combination of how things have manifested over 900 years of our history, you actually see that at the core of everything is the church. It's at the core of everything. And the whole thing, we live in a pyramidical selling scheme run right under a God complex. That's what we live in. Because the higher you get up the ladder, the more of God you're seen as. And everyone below you looks up your ass. We don't get, I mean, it's like, hold on, so where does this manifest from? Where did it start? How did this all come together? So I'm looking at all this. So I goes out and I did It's an Illusion and I know I've upset a lot of people with it's an illusion. And they say to me, it's got to be taken off the internet. It's factually wrong and it's this wrong. Yeah, parts of it are. I'll be the first one to hold my hand up and say they are. But the point is, it lit a fire under your ass. And that's probably what it was. And I was looking for a seed. I was selling, sowing seeds, not selling them, because I didn't get any money for it. I was sowing seeds and I, want, I needed to know the seed I needed to reap. And I couldn't work out. What seed do I need to reap? And I worked it out. Slavery. That's what I needed. Slavery. Why do I need slavery? Why is slavery so important? Because you're all fucking slaves. Every single last one of you. And slavery is not about the colour of some, someone's skin. That's what we've been sold in history. All the peoples of all the lands across this world at one point or another have been enslaved to another people. Go and do your history and go and look at it. So slavery, it's very clever. See, slavery works in the fact is the best slavery works when you, they don't know they're slaves. That's the best slavery. That's the perfect slavery. And that's called democracy. 
and it's got three core elements that are employed. If you want to go and see this, just go and look at Libya. Go and look at Iraq. Go and look at Af Afghanistan. Look what they're doing. They implore three processes. First, we fuck them up, mm -hmm. and we attack them with military and show them how powerful our military is. And then what do they do? Oh, you need educating. But to create the core essence of the law that will be distributed through the education, you need religion. There's your three, your trinity. The Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It's all there. And that's what they're doing. They do this. If you actually look at Libya and look at other places and you look at look for something called the benign dictator. Very, very interesting benign dictators. You know, it doesn't seem, you know, we're told this man did this. I'm told there's terrorists. I've never fucking met one. But I'm told that I've, I've lost certain freedoms and I have to pay excessive amounts of money, which I don't pay because the tax man can fuck right off. I'm sorry, that's my beef. I know you've probably got your beef. You've got your beef with whoever it is. Mine is the tax man. He can fuck himself as far as I'm concerned. 12 years now, tax free. I don't pay a fucking penny to him. There's consequences. I've suffered consequences for it. I um, had a made up figure of 43 grand was sent to the High Court, and then the High Court sent me paperwork, which I sent back very politely saying, fuck off, I don't want your paperwork. They kept sending it, I kept sending it back. And this went on and on. That's where the no contract return to center come from. That's why it come from, that process. That's what I was doing, no contract return to center. I was a bit deluded at the time with the no contract bit. Because what I didn't realise is that you don't have a, you can't argue the contract. The contract is an adhesion contract. They fucking throw it at you and it sticks and there's nothing you can do about it. What they hold against you is your credit rating. That's what they hold against you. That is the biggest thing they have in the civil world. They don't have anything else because you can't do fuck all to you if you don't. I, I say to them, I don't own a house, I don't want to own a house. I don't need credit and I don't want your credit, so you can make me perpetually bankrupt, which someone has put up on the forum that I am perpetually bankrupt. Yes, I am. But at the same time, if I am bankrupt and I don't pay my income tax, the only thing you can do is make me bankrupt again. So how the fuck can you make me doubly bankrupt? <laughs> Thus, I don't pay income tax. You fuck off, leave me alone. And they do. But there's consequences. I don't want you to walk away from it. Oh, I can pay my income tax. And then when they come knocking on your door, that fucking wanker on there, he told me I don't have to pay income tax. Because that's what happens. Because we're always looking for someone to blame. Always. So it goes, well, it's not my fault. Well, actually it is. I've, got, I've been threat threatened again. Um, fucking put me coffee down. I'll be working on it. That's Ben, by the way. Oh, yeah, that's Ben off the forum. If anyone's on the forum, if you've hated Ben for years, now's your chance. <laughs> ben is one monster of a fucking dude. <laughs> no, that's another thing as well, something that happened today. I've met someone who... We've had words on the forum, internet forums, what wonderful places, eh? I'll tell you a little story about TV, you see, in a minute. I met someone today, and I've, for the first time, the context is absolutely bang on, because, I don't know if you know, you know when you're talking to people, the way that I'm speaking to you, obviously you're not speaking back at this moment, so you can if you want to. But, do you know, I'll tell you a little funny story actually, I didn't speak to her, I was about 18 months old, I'm fucking waking up there now, aren't I? <laughs> That's true. But when you meet face to face, you have the ability of body language, you have the ability of expression, eyes, mouth, the whole works. So you get a feeling about how someone is. I don't know if you know at the moment, but the actual people working in councils and people working in London, government and all of them are actually being taught to not use body language. So they're actually basically becoming automatrons. You know, I met a post lady who came to the door the other day to give me a recorded letter, not from it, it was from my son. And she knocked on the door. She was void of emotion. 
There wasn't an ounce of emotion in her. She was void of it. She was a fucking machine. I had another man come to the door who was a courier who was delivering something for my son again. He was he, he reminded me of something out of the Nazi regime. He even spoke with a slightly, I don't know what it was, it could have been German, it could have been Ukrainian, it could have been Russian, I don't know what it was. But he, he had the demeanour of some SS fucking guard. It was like, what's going on? But this is really true. And I know you've had experience, I was talking to my friend over there, Freshy, earlier about experiences with police. The police have got this emotionless, they're void of emotion. But they're not void of emotion if you know how to speak to them. And it's not, not what you expect, it's your attitude is key in everything. It really is key. And I do go off on tangents, you, know, you, you, you probably get used to that fact. Um, I'm pretty bad at it. I've got so much to say, shut up. I've got so much to say, and sometimes I can't get it out quick enough. Do you ever suffer with that? Yeah, I do. You do, but your, your mouth goes quicker than you, you're like, and I have, I've got so much I want to say, and I, they, I had a bit of an epiphany last night, which was really funny actually. My son has been to Amsterdam recently, and come, and uh, anyway, he was telling me about this thing called blue cheese. And please never put this stuff in a cracker and eat it, because I'll tell you, you won't come back for a week. <laughs> <laughs> this is serious, seriously powerful. So he said, ooh, and I said, yeah, go on. So anyway. <laughs> And there's this big thing, I don't know if you remember, when the Queen was currently, I, I, I don't remember, I remember seeing images, the Queen's gown was covered in bees. Do you know why that is? Well, I'll give you my viewpoint of why it is, right? Something, I, I've been a vegetarian for, for quite a long time, and I looked into veganism, but unfortunately, that's, that's a lifestyle, it's not a diet, and I can't afford that lifestyle. Easy, easy. Well, I, I, I wear 25 pound leather trainers. I can't afford 110 pound leather, uh, hemp trainers. I should be able to afford it, hence what we're talking about today. But I, well, I wear these because they're comfortable and generally they're gifts. The clothes I'm wearing actually today are all gifts. Everything, even my jeans are a gift off my sister. My trainers, everything's a gift. I don't actually buy things for myself, I get gifts. Like it, we all do. Anyway, I was looking, like, <laughs> how was smoke last night? Ah, oh, bees, bees. What do they do to bees? They clip the wings of the queen to keep her in the hive. Because otherwise, what she does is, she will do her business and then she'll fuck off somewhere else. Well, that's no good to a beekeeper. He wants to keep the queen. So what do they do? They castrate her by cutting, clipping her wings. And look at the beehive, and you've got a bee, queen bee, and then you've got her government around her, which is generally the, the army and the, uh, the, the bees who make sure. And the workers, I don't know if you noticed that, that bees don't, as far as I know, they don't really sleep very much. The workers go out and they get the pollen and they bring it back. And they work and they work and they work. They don't actually have any spare time, they just work. Who are governed by the military, under the Queen. So, okay, now this is ringing a few bells. Castration. Why would you castrate the Queen? What would you, why would you do that in real life? And it was really interesting because that's what I found out from studying history from 1213 to modern day. I found out about this castration. So why? And then what I see is I see so many people on the internet dissing the monarchy. The way they act, I can bang on actually, correct and dissonant. But just because they've always done the wrong job, doesn't mean they couldn't do the right job if the right man went to the front. I'll leave that thought with you just for a second. And another word I will give, you, give to that is a word called dissolution. And leave that one as well. I'll come back to that, and I really will come back to it. I know I'm renowned for not coming back to things, I will come back to that. So when you look at something like bees or you look at ants and say, you actually can relate a lot of that to, to the way that we live and the slavery that we live in. 
And what we do is we don't see the slavery because we have the distractions and obviously, you know, it is quite obvious to me that we live in 200, and across the world there are 197 countries except the Americans don't recognise one, so that's 196. And there's 210 political regimes within that and each one of them politically regimes basically has a legally defined area of land that is an open prison. Uh, and how the prison works is it's actually, in a lot of ways, it's a psychiatric hospital and everyone's basically schizophrenic. <coughs> because you don't actually know how to control your personalities because you can get angry in a second and then start laughing in the same second. So you have no control over your personalities whatsoever. So you're all fucking schizophrenic. You live in a psychiatric ward that's actually broke up into wards. Funny enough, that's what an MP's consistency is called, the ward. And you have wardens, which is the, obviously the governor of a prison. So it's basically a psychiatric hospital. It's a bit like Rampton. <laughs> It's a prison, but it's actually a psychiatric hospital at the same time. You have staff wandering around who wear these funny costumes, who are getting more and more clobber on them every single day, completely emotionally void. And they basically are the staff. If you want to leave, you've got to be a really good boy, and you've got to go and fill out all the paperwork. You've got to pay for the paperwork, by the way. You don't get this for free. If you want the, the passport, if you want to go to one of the doors to get out of the country, you've got to go and pay for the bit of paperwork. That's a bit Nazi to me. But there you go, that might just be my viewpoint. You've got to conform, you've got to be good, you've got to pay tax, you can't have any debts. But at the same time, once you've got all of that, then you might want to go to another political regime. But unfortunately, because you're going to another political regime, you have to meet the criteria of being able to go to the political regime. So you have to go through all that paperwork that costs you again. Finally, you're allowed to leave. Now, the further up the ladder of hierarchy you get, nearer to the God complex, it, the easier it becomes. But the more of your real self you give away in process, you become heartless. Because the machine out there is heartless. If you ring the council tomorrow and say, I've got 130 quid, do you want me to pay your council tax or do you want me to feed my kids? They'll tell you to pay your council tax. Because it's heartless. It hasn't got a heart. It doesn't give a fuck. Fuck your kids, I want my money. That's what they're basically saying, yeah? They don't quite say that, but they are, that seems why you've got a basis of So it can't be denied that we live in a prison. But it's not a free prison. You've got to pay to live here. Now that's modelled on Marshall C, an old prison from London, or Fleet. And they were debtors' prisons that you had to pay to live in. And while you were paying to live in the prison, you couldn't pay off the debt, so inevitably you stayed in the prison. I don't know if you know, but Fleet Prison's famous because everyone who lived, who went to Botany Bay in Australia to colonise Australia, came from Fleet Prison. And most of them had done very, very menial things and were deployed. So, I looked at this and said, well, how do you do that? How do you actually get to that stage? How, how, how do you create slavery without anybody knowing they're actually enslaved? And no one asked, you see, and, and, and the core of this is you can't question. That's the core. Now, that process seems to come from St. Gout. There's another thing that exists that you can't question. You're not allowed to question it. Try it. It's fascinating. I remember once I was doing a job and a, a lady vicar came around to see the old lady that I was doing the job for. And I got talking to her. This was a long time ago, actually. And I don't normally beat around the bush, I normally go for the throat, it's the easiest way. So what's all these bollocks about Jesus then? <laughs> that always sets the scene. Anyway, oh Jesus died for our sins. I went, whoa, hold on a minute. No, 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 no. No, 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 I'm not having that. I said, because if Jesus died for our sins, and you were saying that, I said, so he's died for sins we haven't committed. So if he's died for sins we can't commit it, that's like going to a bar and getting pissed out your skull because someone's picking up the tab. I said, so basically, you can do what you fucking want in your life. You can be the biggest, baddest bastard, but it's okay because the geezer at the end goes, you're all right, no worries. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Oh, Jesus died for our sins. They're fucked. They can't go any further. They're stuck. They get absolutely broken and stuck on the same thing because it's a stagnated belief system, a core belief system, that they dead leave. 
They might have wonders about it, and they might go to themselves and go, I'm going to leave it, I'm going to leave it. And they go, oh, no, 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 go back, go, go back, go, go back. I don't believe in God. Oh, yeah, I do, I do, I do. And this is what we do all the time. We seriously do this. I don't know if you've ever watched people, but they do do it. You can get them, and you can pull them out. And you're pulling them, pulling them, pulling them, and all of a sudden, no, I'm going to go back. But that core, that core is the very basis of what we live in. That is its creation. It came from that. The foundation of all law comes from that. And it all works on the same principle. It's stagnating. It doesn't move forward. It doesn't go backward. It stays as it is. Thus slavery stays as it is. But they want to keep take, take, take from you. Because that's how it's sold. And it's sold to them out there. We're doing this for your own protection. It's for your own good. But to do this, we need this off of you. But the thing is, the second they take one thing, they take again, and again, and again. And they keep taking, with the same excuse. It's for your good. It's for your own good. We're doing this for your protection. When I saw, when I saw this, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa this, is, this, is, this is good stuff. I'm enjoying this. I'm really good. So, I rings up Parliament. And I rings up, and I speak to them, and I speak to you. I want to answer a question. Basically, this is what I'm going to find out. You fuckers. Right, I've got an idea. Use bigger words and speak slightly more, slightly, just raise my, just speak slightly different, and I'll tell them I'm an author. Because I'm not lying, I am an author. I'm writing a book. They don't need to know what the fucking book's about. I'm just writing a book. It could be a kid's book for all they know. Rings about. Oh, by the way, start to use slightly bigger words, like blah, blah, They start to talk to me. So I come off the phone, I'm like smiling all over my face. This is how it works. This is how you get information out of these people. You have to become one of them. So basically, you put their mask on, pretend to be one of them, then they'll give you the information, and then you back back off again. You become yourself again. So I looked into things, when I was doing it, it's an illusion, I was looking, at one of the big key issues is the birth certificate. And there was a really big argument about whether this declaration was on a birth certificate. The birth certificate I had had a declaration on it. But that, to me, is immaterial now. The reason being is because it's the certificate itself that is the most important aspect, because it's a register of a slave. And it doesn't matter how you look at it, because why would you possibly want a register of human beings? Why? For what reason? What, so you can make and pay for passports? Well, why can't I travel the world for fucking free anyway? Who the fuck says you own the world? Who give you the right to fucking lock things down and not allow me to go where I fucking please? Well, a place I inhabit equally with every other fucking human being. I'll sack the parliament. <laughs> I really do get passionate about it. Some people will call this anger. And there is an element of anger in me, because I am fucked off. Every day I have to witness what human beings do to each other. Every single day. And because it is addictive, I end up seeing myself doing the same things. At least, but at the end of the day, I kick the shit out of myself, metaphorically and mentally, for doing it. If I've said a bad word to someone, or I've stacked up, in the morning, do not talk to me unless I have had one cup of coffee and at least one plate. Don't talk to me. Don't even fucking enter my fucking space. <laughs> but the thing is, my partner's the same. So can you imagine? It's like World War fucking three in my house at eight o'clock in the morning. But we both say sorry after. Because although we can't help from doing it because I, I don't sleep well anyway, we both say sorry because we both realise what we've done. And that's the problem, that's the point. If you realise you've done something wrong to another human being, fucking apologise for it. Just apologise, just say sorry. I didn't mean to do that. It probably won't stop me doing it again because I am an arsehole. But I am apologising for it. You can now see why it says on the website very clearly, if you're easily offended, do not come. There's a lot of language in there. I will use words that you do not want to hear. But if you've got a problem with the words that I'm using, 
the literal words I'm using, then just place yourself in the fact that you're worrying about a word while fucking poverty still exists in this day and age. I've got a cure for poverty. You like my cure for poverty. I'm going to take the money from every fucking commercial institute across this fucking well and give it to the impoverished. Yeah. They don't fucking need it. They've got fucking enough. That's how you solve poverty. You don't go on the fucking town leaving arts and pictures of poor little kids. That, and they do, they prey on the goodness of your heart. Oh, that poor little child. So you give me three quid. Oh, but £2.96 is definitely, yeah, is that a fact, is it? So you've got to turn, now you're going to send me documentation that proves that my three pound went all the way through the system and landed up in the place there. Now, go and ask them for it. Go and ask them for the proof. Oh, well, we can't do that. No, we, we wouldn't keep such records. Fuck off your world. We've owned around fucking records. You record everything. <laughs> you do. Tesco knows what fucking toilet paper I wipe my ass with. And if you fold now, Andrex are asking if you fold or not, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> you fold or a cruncher? No, but you see my point, they record everything, so why couldn't you know? I, you've got to pay income tax. Right, well where the fuck's it going? What are you doing with it? Well, we, we, we can't... But you can. You have a record for everything. You can do this, you can know. And if you're asked to give a donation to support the political regime that you live in, then surely you should, if it was done in transparency, you should have the ability to actually know where that money's gone and what it was used for. But we don't ask, do we? Do we ever ask? We don't. What I find most fascinating is, I've gone up against loads of things, loads and loads of things. Like I said, I went up against taxpayers, there's consequences. I face the consequences, I live with consequences daily. The only reason, and I'll be absolutely honest with you, the only reason I'm here and doing the talks again, so I've refused for the last two years, the only reason I'm here is because I've been pushed into this because my work's dried up and I work cash and hands. I can't go to a job centre and get a job because I don't have any other criteria. No. So my job is my work is cash and hands. And then you get some prick like Nick Clegg goes on the television, and I'm sorry to call him a prick, but he was talking like a prick. It's immoral to give tradesmen cash. Are you fucking mental? What does a tradesman do with his cash? What do I do? Do I take it over and shove it under the fucking mattress? No. My wife goes and gets her hair done. Well, she knows she's out to wear but she actually cuts her own hair, but I'm talking metaphorically. <laughs> I go and get shopping. I go and buy fuel. So if you want to break it down, who actually keeps the economy going? The tradesman who spends his cash, or the banker who keeps his money in the fucking bank? The only reason it's immoral in their view is that they, they can't extract taxation from a payment in cash so they can go to war with another fucking country. That's what a good percentage of it goes towards, I promise you. And they say, People argue, they say, you've got to pay income tax. What about schools? What about this? What about public services? I say, what about fucking VAT? Because yeah. I'll tell you what, you're not getting taxed every second of every day, but you get fucking VAT every second of every day on everything you do. You go and buy a fucking tune off of iTunes, there's fucking VAT involved. So where's all the VAT going? You fuckers make billions out of this. No one questions it. Bring up the VAT office and ask them what VAT is. Value added tax. Ask them. They haven't got a fucking clue. <laughs> they cannot give you an answer. Because no fucker knows. Because it's just a dreamt up fucking way of oppressing people that's now reached 20%. My talks this time around are about stating the absolute fucking obvious. And for once, and actually giving you an idea how powerful you really are. That works on the very principles that I'm talking about. Works on the opposite of it. How you can affect them in such a way they won't be looking down their nose saying you fucking straight, I'm not talking to you. They'll be on their fucking knees looking up saying please don't do it anymore. Do you want to 
You want to know what that idea is? Yeah. Why do I? Right. Is there any questions you'd like to ask me? We'll get a few questions out of later. I know. Otherwise, if we get to left to the end, you might forget what you want to ask them. A lot of what you were saying earlier about the passports and having to pay for a passport when it's our divine right to travel. I've, I've, uh, I, I lost my. I lost, I lost my um, <clears throat> driving license, and they want twenty quid off me to renew it. And I, I personally don't really want to own a receive my driving license. But is there any way I can uh, say to him, look, can I have my license back without no. paying for it? No, it's mine. Sort of I know what you're saying, but no, that's not how the system works, is it? No. Yeah, you've got to appreciate. You can go up against the system. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you some fascinating things, experiences that friends of mine. I only speak of my own experiences, and experiences of people that I know. And that's the only thing I can speak from. You know, when, when did all that bullshit come out about these photo licenses? The second I heard about it, I went, fuck off, I'm not interested. And it turned out I wasn't the only one. It turns out there's quite a few thousands, if not tens of thousands of us, who actually said exactly the same. Um, the only difference, be, the only problem being is that I don't physically have a photo ID. And obviously a lot of the things that are going on out there now, you do need some form of photo ID. You know, I, in my job, do a, quite a bit of plumbing. And that sounds a bit odd, but I am, I do multiple trades. Can't use my base trade, but I do a lot of plumbing. I'm sparky and all sorts. I collect copper. If I take out copper from a house and renew it, I collect the copper. I then go to scrapyard and weigh the copper in. They weigh it, they give me the equivalent what it's worth. I can't do that anymore, because now to do that I need photo ID and I need a bank account because they've stopped paying cash to the scrap men. That's what they're doing, yeah, they're doing, you can either have a cheque, you can have payment the same day but you've got to pay £3.50 for a back transfer, or there's some that's it though, that is the method isn't it? Yeah, there is two methods. Uh, you have to have photo ID. If you haven't got photo ID with an address on it, you have to produce utility bills not more than three months old. This is the way in a bit of fucking cock. But because they're so frightened that you're going to be not giving them their tax money. That's what they're so frightened of and that's what it's always been about. And they use the excuse, well, this is to protect, um, it's all come about supposedly from the rail industry. I don't know if you, yeah, do you know about this? You know, they were nicking the over. <laughs> that takes a bottle and cut a 25,000 volt fucking cable, I tell you. Well, they, were nicking the, they were nicking cable off of, supposedly. I don't know anyone who's ever involved in that, the same as I've never met a terrorist or blah, 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 even though I'm told they do exist. <laughs> But I've been told a lot of it. I've been told God exists, but I've never fucking met him. I'll tell you what, if I did meet him, I'd punch a twat straight in my front. I would, I'd kick him straight in the nuts. Someone called me the devil the other day. They actually did call me, they said I'm the Antichrist. I've got to do a talk in Liverpool. If you, any of you can come, come, because it's in a church. He's actually at a church, which is even more ironic. My wife, my partner said to me, ooh, can't blaspheme, can't swear. I went, it's a fucking building. It's all it's ever been. Just because you call it by a silly name, don't distract from the fact, it's just a fucking building. I got the fucking lockdown, every one of them. Big graveyards up. Usual for saying fucking useful. Like putting houses on that are desperately needed. There's so much that I would do if I, if I could do it. There really is. I'd like to see a free world based on equality, not equity. And that's all I want to see. And I will keep doing this until I see it. Until I finally see it. And I have an idea how that can come about. Council tax is a very, very poignant issue for a lot of people. Very poignant indeed. And there's, I, I still know to this day a group that are They've been fighting this for six or seven years and they literally have gone to every length possible, including the High Court, everywhere they can go to actually stop council tax. And to this day, they haven't achieved it. But I know one man in Wales 
who hasn't played for four years and never gets bothered. And I will tell you how he does it. I'm not telling you to do it, but I will never tell you to do anything. And if anyone ever tells you to do something, you should fucking question the fact that you do do it. No one has a right to make a decision for you. You have to make the decisions yourself as part of being a human being, as part of being an individual. If you start to, if you start to, obviously, if I say to you, go and do this, and we go and do it, and it goes wrong, well, you're a fucking fool, not me. You shouldn't have fucking listened to a, an ex member patient. <laughs> 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 really, come on. Now the man sits there, well he did tell you he'd been in an asylum for a fucking year, you twat. <laughs> There's this little trick, and the trick is very, very simple. When you set the bill, then what you do is you reply with a letter that says, thank you for sending me this, uh, you don't call it a bill or anything like that, it doesn't actually matter what you call it, you say, thank you for sending me this, I've read this and taken take a note, and my charge for reading it is the 1200 blah, 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 thank you very much, can you make my account show that the balance is nil? He's been doing this for four years, and they never touched him. And I have information that says that a good percentage of the people in an area of North Wales, which I'm going to, funny enough, so I'll have more information about it when I get there. I've been doing the same for a long, long time. And it's about that bill. It's about when it comes. If you've got the bill and you start to pay, you're stuck. It's about physically returning that and saying, well, yeah, thank you very much. I've read it, but it costs you this much for me to read it. <laughs> I don't know how long it's going to work, because generally I, I had a very interesting incident with my van getting taken by some bailiffs, which according to their own legislation wasn't possible because they're not allowed to touch the tools of my trade. But the police came there and I was really green at the time. I didn't understand what was going on. And this very, very nasty um, constable said to me, get your fucking tools out of there. And I'm like, well, or I'm gonna arrest you. And I didn't work out what was going on. I, didn't, I, I couldn't work it out. Anyway. And there is a really comical story to this. So my, my sons were there. And my sons, I've got um, four sons. And two of them are, are quite up to. They really do get the up when something happens to a member of the family. They're, they're not, they're not the, the good, good lads in every respect. But they get the up. So we... In the end, it turned out that they were going to take my van, so I don't know they were going to take it. So I said, yeah, okay, but you know, obviously I can't, I didn't know what to do, really didn't know what to do. So Lee said to me, Lee said to me, he said, fuck them. He said, if they're taking that van, he said, I'm going to get all the rubbish out of the black bin bags and stick it in there. So when they parked it up and they come back to it weeks later, it's going to fucking stick. <laughs> Yeah, I said, yeah, I don't really want to do that. His mum's going, don't, don't you do that, don't you? He did. Yeah, I knew what he's like. You know? So anyway, he did it. They took the van. My mate phoned me up. He now lives in New Zealand. And he said, you all right? I said, no, we're just taking me van. He goes, well, go down to court, get a statute of declaration. I went, what's, what, what's that? He said, just go to the court, get a statute of declaration, fill it out, fill it out, say that you've never been in a court, you've never been convicted for it, and you require your van back. I went, you, are you sure? He said, yeah, go to the court and get one. I went, okay, so I rang up, I made a phone call, I said, to him. And I said, uh, yeah, come down. I got this statute declaration, they give me the paperwork, I said, what do you want it for? I said, well, basically, I said, I've had some property of mine taken, but, um, and it, but I, it was over a fine, but I was, I've never been to court about this. I said, oh, right, you want this one? So they give me this statue declaration. I went back and I went, right, fill it in. So I just filled it out. I made an appointment to go back. And I went, up, went, I went to the office and a really, really lovely lady, this is what I'm talking about, human beings. She was lovely. I went there, I said, I've filled out this. I don't know what I've got to do now. She said, no, oh, you've actually filled it out wrong. She said, look, hold on one minute. And she got another one and she helped me fill it out. And then I saw it. And she said, there you go, now wait there and I'll get an usher to come and take you into a court because you have to go into, into the court 
to hand it over to the magistrate, they will either agree with it or they'll disagree with it. I went, okay, no problem. So anyway, I hung around and they said, all right, you're going to go into this court. So I goes into the public gallery and I sat there and I'm listening to this man getting uh, done for drink driving. And then the usher come in and he says, oh, you're actually in the wrong court. I need you downstairs. Oh, okay, so he goes downstairs. Goes in, there's no one in the court, three magistrates, there was a lady in the middle. They took the form off of me, took it to her, she looked at it, looked at me, signed it, she didn't read it. She looked at it, looked at me, signed it, and gave me it back. I said, what happens now? She said, go and get your van. <laughs> I went, what? He said, yeah, we'll fax the company that's taking your van and tell them that you're going to come and get it. I went, really? That simple. I said, what about the, you know, the, the fine and all the money? He said, oh, don't worry about that. He said, that'll just be quashed. <laughs> so this is like a few days after, I goes down there, and guess what's been in the back for a few days? <laughs> do you know what the most colourful bit is? And you obviously know with meat products and stuff like that, it very soon turns to maggots. What? What, really? But it very soon turns to maggots. For weeks after, I was working on a job not far from my home, so I was going home for dinner. I would go to my van at dinner time, I'd open the door, and there'd be a torrent of flies oh. leaving inside of the van. Oh. I'd go home, have me dinner, go back to work, when I left in the evening, open the door, another torrent of flies, and this went on for weeks. So the moral, the moral really is of the story. You know, I mean, my son shouldn't have done what he, he was doing, and I got proper payback for letting him do it. But I was absolutely stunned with how it happened and what happened. And this statue that I was then told, and this is what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to get at, is this. When you find these processes and they work, it might only work once. They don't often work twice because they will close the loophole. You've got to imagine, right, this is your situation. You're in a game of football and there's 11 of you. Okay, you've got a full-size goal and you've got a full-size pitch. Yeah? The other side have 22, they have a tiny little goal that big, and they own the ball. That's the situation you're in. And on that note, I'm going to have a thank you. Do you want a chair, mate? Yeah, just a chair. Yeah, you Maybe wants the guitar as well.
Has anyone come from far afield? Chesterfield. Uh, London. Oh, London. Very nice. I just find it fascinating. I read that. Because it's... I suppose what I find more fascinating than anything, because it's something that I wouldn't do. No, I'm, I'm being really serious when I say that. I've never... When I first started, like I said, there was a lot of influences kind of like directing me. The, the first time TPUC become live, I got some very, very interesting phone calls because I, I, I did actually have a phone number on there. So you know, I was the only one to get in touch. Cause I, and it was originally called the People's United Commu uh, Collective. And I, I designed it to collect information. I wanted to talk to people who knew their own subjects. Because I, obviously I didn't know this, a lot of subject matter that was being, I was going to be delving into. And there was, I was given law, I was given history, I was given certain aspects of it. And it kind of, I, did, I really didn't understand. When I was at school, I went to a, thanks, what, I don't have milk. Wait, no, no, thank you. You're going to do your job, do your problem, yeah? He <laughs> doesn't even get paid for, bro. <laughs> but when I was at school, I went to a ex grammar school. Um, it, it was a, a boys' school that had kind of lost its status, if you like, which is really quite comical. And it was, I was expelled at, I was 15, was I 15? No, actually I was expelled when I was just about three months after being 14, because I was in a, I was put in an asylum, but it wasn't very good for the school's image to have one of its pupils locked up in, a, in, a, in an asylum. So they expelled me, and I, I could never work out why. Why did call me being expelled? And I was like, well, hold on a minute, they're actually trying to get me to accept these spells. You know, this is the way the world is, and you're going to accept this, whether you like it or not, you are going to accept it, and you can't question this. And that's the spell. So when you don't accept the spell, you get expelled. That makes sense to me. The, the, the school I went to, had a way of getting you to learn. If you didn't learn, they used to beat it into you, literally. And that would result in a big heavy Bible being smacked across the top of your head, or a cane, or a slipper. And the teacher, my actual form teacher, had a unique way of slippering you. Fortunately, I never went through it, because he was actually quite a very, he was a nice guy when you got to know him properly. But his way of doing it was to take you to the gymnasium, Stand you about halfway up the gymnasium, bent over, and he would run at you, and as he ran past you, he'd hit you with a slipper. Which you can imagine was a very, very painful event. I just, I, I always had this image of one day someone sticking their foot out and him going face, face first into the deck. <laughs> so, yeah. But it was really interesting because I used to make comments and I used to say, well, who gave you the right to hit me? because I've not given you it, and I, as far as I understand, the only man who can give you the right to hit me is me. No one else can do that on my behalf, but I didn't understand how the system works at that time. I didn't understand that they do things because they say, well, yeah, and we can lawfully do this because law is literal. And I've just, funny enough, I've just been speaking to someone outside about the last chapter of my book. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's chapter 27. If you like porn, read chapter 27. Because it is very pornographic, the beginning of it. But my partner was reading Fifty Shades of Grey. I said, is that book selling well? She said, yeah. I said, oh, it's all right. I'll just chuck a bit in there. <laughs> Good marketing tool, isn't it? <laughs> That's what I did. And I had fun writing it as well. I've never write anything like that, which is really good. But it's not there abstractly, it's there because there's a talk about law in there. There's about uh, political insurrection that is basically, they're called the dislikes. This is what I've named them. And the dislikes are soldiers who have the notion of, or carry the notion, notion of pacifism. So that has to be got out of them because obviously they won't do what is needed to be done with the notion of passivism. 
So they're called dislikes. And dislikes are set up into situations, and basically how it is, they're attacked by their own people. So other soldiers attack soldiers, but these soldiers are dressed in plain clothes, are dressed as all the rest of the protesters. We would call them now agents provocateurs. That's what we would call them, but that's basically why I'm explaining. And then it's the kettling, the, 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 the protest wasn't violent whatsoever. It was made violent by the, the basically the police at the time. And then the rest of the people who were caught, the women are kettled in, the men have already been killed, there's a big stack of their bodies waiting to be burned. And then the women are basically, what's going on to the women, I won't go into the gory details, in the book it does go into gory details. But it's what is said by Farrick, the character, to one of the guards who's performing the act. And he said to him, he says, how can you do this? They're human beings. And he said, no, they're not human beings anymore. They forego their right to life the second they enter into a political insurrection or some form of protest against the establishment at the time. And he says, and he, he basically they're having this, this conflict and it really gets quite heated because Farrakh is distraught with what he's seen. And he says, but, you know, he says, you can't do this, you're murdering, this is, this is against the law. And he said, no, if someone foregoes their right to life, then it's not murder anymore. But what I'm trying to get at is, this law is literal. It is very, very literal. So you, you have to look at law being literal. And it's very interesting when certain circumstances arise that when you take the literal... I mean, I had a, I'll, I'll tell you a story once. When I was about... I don't know how old I was. I was probably about 20. I was working for a company. And there was me and another lad from Stevenage who were working for this company. And we got told on the choir that this company employs you for so long and then on the last week they knock you for your last week's money. And we've been warned about this. Yeah, thank you. Better service next time. <laughs> so we've been warned. So what we, we, we decided that on the last week, all the tools that we had from the company that we were using, we were going to keep and we would do them up between us to make up for the wages that we were going to be not. Now, they do say consumption is the mother of all fuck ups. And I would agree with that in certain cases, but in this case, it was very, very interesting because it did happen. We were not. So we thought, well, we got the tools, we'll keep the tools, we'll flog them, we'll get our money back. Anyway, cut long story short, that was on the Friday. On the Sunday morning, bang, 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 six o'clock in the morning, Steve is CID. We come and search your house under the, you, and you're suspected of theft of tools. It was really quick. It was amazingly quick. So anyway, he said, yeah, I've got it. And they said to me, why did you take them? I said, because I've got locked from me last week's money. So go and check it out. I said, so I did it for a reason. They went, well, we still stole them. I said, yeah, okay, I'll hold my hands up. Yeah, we stole them. Right, so set a court date, so some months later I'll go to the court, so I go to the court, I'll get to her on my own, and my mate's there with his, his lawyer. And I turn to him and I go, you're right, he says, yeah, I can't talk to you. My lawyer says, I can't talk to you. Really? Yeah. Right, well, goes into the court, and the magistrate in the middle says to me, you know, do you realise what the charges are read out, you've left the tools? I said, yeah. And she said, would you like to say anything? I said, yeah, actually, I would. I said, there's a reason why I took them tools. I said, I'm not disputing the fact I stole the tools, but I did. I said, well, I'll tell you the reason why I did it. And I explained. And I said, actually, you see that man over there who's actually prosecuting me? I said, if you ask him honestly and he tells the truth, he'll tell you that this company has done this to no end of tradesmen over the last few years. And this situation that what I find myself in has been in this court or in this courthouse many, many times because of this company ripping off tradesmen. The prosecutor turned around and said, Mr. Harris is telling the truth. This really was the case. He said, well, look, we're binding you over to keep the peace because you didn't, you shouldn't have stolen the tools, but you've admitted that, but we're dropping the rest of the case. You're free to go. My mate walks in there with the lawyer and pleads not guilty. After listening to what I've said, he pleads not guilty because his lawyer told him to plead not guilty. And it's like, I looked at him, 
you're not right. You can't be right. And that, that was even then, so I knew the principle. I, knew, I had done something wrong. I'd stolen the tools. I hold, I hold my hands up, but there was a reason why I'd done it. So the law was very literal then as well, because the law said, yeah, you committed theft. I went, yeah, I committed theft. It doesn't matter what the intention was behind the theft, I committed theft. And then in, the eyes, in their eyes, that's the wrong thing. And they're absolutely right. It is wrong to steal things from people. I know corporations out there are stealing from you every single day, but that doesn't mean you stealing from them makes that right. That actually creates even more of a problem. Because if you steal from them, they will steal more to compensate what you're stealing. And that means that everybody else is suffering because of you. I'll give you an example of this. Get a credit card tomorrow. Go get a credit card. It doesn't matter what the way it is, you can get one for, I don't know, 15 out of credit or 7 grand. Max out the credit card. When they send you the bill, don't the fuck off. Okay? They'll never come after you. They've never come after me. Ever. I've done it loads of times. I used to do it so many times. I've done it with banks, I've done it with all sorts. Like I said, I used to do rock banks, it was really easy. I used to do it with paperwork. So I'd walk in, take 100 grand a day, every single day for 28 days, just don't go in on the 29th. And you can do it in multiple branches. You used to be able to do it because they didn't have the technology they have now to check your account, blah, 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 blah. It just took you all face value. And as long as they knew that that money was going to hit their account when you got your wages paid in, the wages were never going to hit the account. That was the whole scam. But the point is, I was wrong, very, very wrong in what I did. It was not right to do it. But then when I finally, I did go in on the 29th day once, I got caught, went into the manager's office, and I basically had a, a, a meeting with the manager, and he said, I want to check, but I said, well, you're not going to get your money back. And he just looked at me and says, well, I kind of know. I know I'm not going to get the money back. And he didn't actually say it, but he looked, the way he looked, he knew that I knew the game. He knew that getting that checkbook back would stop me from doing anything more, but he would never get that bank's money back. Because they had no attachment to me whatsoever. Nothing. I didn't own anything that they didn't latch onto. And that's what I realised we have latched onto us. There has to be something that latches onto us so they can apply their attachment to it. So numerous things I've done, numerous, loads and loads of things that I've done that have, are not right, but they've given me the evidence I needed to be able to work out how their system works, how it really works, and how simple it is. So you go get your credit card, and you go out and you max it out. You tell them to fuck off. You literally do, right? Now, they're insured against loss. An insurance company that insures them is also insured against loss. And the insurance company that insures them is also insured against loss. But it's the very top boys who are the most interesting that sit down in the city of London where I was on Thursday. Such as the companies like Guy Carpenter, big, big, massive insurance companies, insurers and insurers, because they take the money from the public purse. Because anyone in that world never loses. They never lose. They take it from the public purse. All of you lot who haven't done it are refilling that, that purse. So you can do this, you can do this on a daily, you can do this daily, but you are hurting the rest of the people you belong to by doing it. That's all. <laughs> yes. They are taking, but what I'm trying to say is, the, the, when you get to the end of the pile, that is coming out of the public purse. These people do not lose. They do not banks. Banks are a classic example of that. And when you can take, you can take banks to the cleaners unless you own property. If you own property, they've got something to latch onto, and they'll charge you, and they really will. They'll place a charge on it if they can't make before the force of sale, and then when the house is sold eventually, they will get their first cut. That's what you would call it, some people call it a commercial lead. It's, it's basically a charge. That's what they do. This is how they get around things. And they've been doing this for years and years and years, and they're experts in it. Absolute experts in it. So don't think for one minute that you're going to come along being the novice that you are, not having an expert in years and years, hundreds of years in fact, to develop these systems, that you're going to walk in there and go, ha <laughs> yeah, I know more than you. Okay, because they'll just look at you, laugh, smile, and say, fuck off. Idiot. 
they really will. I've walked in, I've done all sorts of things regarding that side of things. Like I said, the High Court and bankruptcy. The consequences, they're there. I face the consequences. I live the consequences every single day. But the fact of the matter is, no way that what was more important, a good credit rating or not paying income tax. And to me, not paying income tax is worth far more than a good credit rating. That really is. I want to actually apply for an exemption system. I've got a way, I'd love to do it. So I can actually walk into a shop and say, can you take the back off that? Can you take any, any tax off of that? Can you take your back and do that on it? I won't get one, but it'd be funny asking. Do you know how my income tax didn't come about? It was hilarious. I, when I was looking into law, I looked at Magna Carta quite in depth. And I looked at a segment of Magna Carta, which is Article 61. And I looked at it and went, Oh, Nick, that says if we're not happy with the governments of this country, then we can withhold or we can deceive them, deceive them, whatever. Well, that part of that's taxation. So that means if I'm not happy with the governments, I can actually say, well, fuck you. When you govern it properly, I'll then I'll give you tax. So when I rang the tax office, like the idiot I am, they said, well, we need five grand out of you or whatever it was at the time. It escalated. I went, well, according to this law I found, in this document called Magna Carta, which pretty much is sort of like a foundation document that everything's set up on, bar law, the law of law main, which is even more interesting. I said, it says that I don't have to pay you if I feel I'm being ungoverned uh, unjustly. So, well, I do feel I'm being governed unjustly, so fuck you, I'm not paying. And they never said to me, well, no, that law doesn't apply. They never said to me, well, actually, that law does apply, but it doesn't apply to you. They basically whitewashed it, went straight from the bankruptcy after accumulating the amount of uh, expenses and stuff and like what they piled on top of it to 43 grand. They basically got it from 500 to 43 grand, which is a monumental task in its own. It's quite easy if you're just fucking adding north. And um, it got to that stage, and then it was like they completely whitewashed it. I told the I court to get stuffed. And then that was it, the matter was dropped. I had a phone call from the insolvency office saying, you've been made bankrupt. I said, thank you for telling me that, because I didn't actually know. And she said, the lady said, very politely, she was quite polite actually, she said, we need you to come to the insolvency office to get it organised. So you normally stay, what, it's about a year bankrupt. They sort of have to do all this information, blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, if you can answer me a question, then I'll come. She said, well, yeah, fair enough, it was a bit odd. For her, and I could tell in her voice that she found it a bit odd. I said, Well, look, if you can tell me how you're going to make me walk out my door, get in my car, drive seven miles, park my car, get out of my car, walk up to your office, how are you going to get me to walk into your office, sit down, how are you going to make me sign anything, and how are you going to make me read anything? She said, Well, I can't. I said, Well, as far as I'm concerned, the matter's closed. And that's when I suddenly realised that the civil side of things is completely different from the criminal side of things. So what they did, and you've got to hold your hat up, because this is genius, they created a way of converting civil to criminal. So they can use the private political army called the police against you. Now, I had an incident with a motorbike, and the fine was £90. I basically just went, oh, fuck, I can't be asked for it. Anyway, it went on for months and months and months. This bailiff turned up at the house. And she, it was really quite odd actually, because she said to me, I need 90 pounds. I went, 90 quid, this has been going on for months, why isn't it 400 or something? She said, because it's criminal, it can't, it can't go up. I went, excuse me? She said, well it's criminal, you are fined 90 pounds and the court requires 90 pounds. I said, yeah, but any other time bailiffs come to the door, the bill's gone from 30 to 400 or something. Oh, she said, no, I'm not a criminal. Oh, that's fascinating. I said, well, no, I'm not giving you a night bell. Oh, okay, she said, I have to get the police. I said, what are you doing as you want? Anyway, a little while later, back at the door, and I'm not stupid enough to just go and open the front door. So I opened the window, and this cop stood there, and I said, um, can I help you out? He says, yeah, you've got to pay 90 pounds. I said, well, since when are you the private enforcement for um, corporations. He said, I'm not working for a corporation, I'm working for the courts. I said, yeah, but you're working for one and the same. 
just because you call it by a different name doesn't distract from the fact it's part of a corporation. Well, I'm not interested in that, I want 90 pounds, and I'm not giving you it. He said, right, well, I'm going to get a squad to come and kick the door in. I said, well, if you do that, you're going to have to pay. He said, no, no, if you're in the house and we kick the door down, you have to pay. If you're not in the house and we kick the door down, then we have to pay. I went, right, so let me get this right. You're going to boot my door in and manhandle me for 90 pounds. Is this what you're telling me? Yeah, and I'm going to ring now a special crew to come and break your door down. So now, well, let's get this straight. You're not going to do it yourself. You're going to get another group of old bully boys to do it for you. Yeah. I said, how much is this fucking costing? You only want 90 quid. <laughs> he said, it's the law. I went, oh, okay. So anyway, I let him in. And I stood there. And this was the, one of the biggest changes in my life. It happened right at that second. I stood there and I said, look mate, I said, I need to get some proper clothes on that. He says, well, yeah, go on in. He come and follow me up the stairs. And I went, hold on mate, on privacy. Oh no, I've got to come with you. I said, whoa, 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 you're in my house. I said, oh no, no, he said, it's not your house anymore. <laughs> because it's gone from being private to public because I've allowed them in. They're like fucking vampires. You have to invite these people in. If not, they'll break your door down. That's how it works. So I said, mate, come on. I said, look, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't giving you no hassle. I've, yeah, I've, I've gone to you a bit. I said, I ain't giving you no hassle. I'm just going to live upstairs. It came up and it stood on a landing. So I got changed. The same said to me, pay the bill. Just pay it. And I don't mean something out there, said to me, or something down there, or whatever you want. Inside, this voice said to me, you're putting your family through hell for this. This is 90 quid. Just pay the bill. Pay it, but just, and I was like, and the war inside me was incredible. My mind's going, you fucking coward, you fucking wanker. You're going to pay them after everything you've said and everything you've done on the internet, you fucking coward. My heart's going, don't listen, don't listen. It's a knobhead, it's not fucking telling you the truth. So anyway, I went, do you know what? Fuck it, my family are going through hell. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing it to them. And I realised this is a very, very powerful. Well, it was, like I said, it was quite an epiphany happened that day. So I went to the drawer and I had 120 quid in the drawer. And we were going to go shopping for that 120 quid. So I said, no, I'm going to have a bit. And I took it out to the cop. I said, no, I'm going to pay. I said, but I want you to know something. I said, that 90 pound is now you're taking the food from my children's mouths. I don't give a fuck, it's the law. That was his words. That was his words. And that's when I really realised how heartless the machine is. That's when I realised that there is only one way to sort this problem out. That, it hit me then, but the whole notion of it didn't come to a lot later on. I walked down the stairs, I didn't pay the copper, I, I paid the bailiff. She went to come in the house, I said, no, I'm really sorry. I said, you ain't got power to come in the house, you stay where you are. So I'm not being rude. I said, well, this is, there's a principle to this. <coughs> she said to me, there's a receipt for the money. I said, I don't want a receipt. I said, you, you are taking food from my children's mouth over something that is pathetic. She never got to this in the first place. Well, if you'd have paid, you would never have got to this. I said, yeah, but the point is, I should never have been fined in the first place. Never been fined. This is ridiculous. She said, you need a receipt, and I wouldn't take a receipt. And then she said, look, seriously, you really need this. Now, I've kind of picked something up along the last six years. I don't know, some of you might get this. When something repeatedly happens, it generally means you should do it. If there's an instance where you go to do something and it doesn't happen the first time, it generally means you shouldn't be doing it. Now, I'm not going to get into the logistics of where that information comes from, because I don't actually care where it comes from. But I do find it quite an interesting rule to follow. Even at work, I find it's a very interesting rule. So, anyway, I, I took the receipt and I shut the door. I chuck the receipt in the cupboard and I forgot all about it. And then I went for probably about a week beating the shit out of myself about what I'd just done. And do you know why? Because I had an image on the internet that I didn't want destroyed. 
because I'd fell into the trap of delusions of grandeur. I'd become what I was against. Because that's what happens, you become what you're against. Because it rubs off on you. And there's nothing you can do about it either. And there's a lot of the reasons I wouldn't come back out and do this, because I was frightened it's going to happen again. But now, my feet are firmly on the floor, and that's where they're going to stay. And the reason they're going to stay there is because I have a notion of how to sort this out, and they have to stay there to, to sort this out. I did come up with quite a colourful idea, actually. I was actually going to send the bill to the Queen and say, well, I've served affidavits on you, I've divorced myself from you, you fucking owe me 90 quid. I never did send it. So, all the, like I'm trying to explain to you is all the bits and pieces that I've gone through, the experience that I've gone through, have led to something that, I've, that is very, very interesting. I once stood on a stage and said, um, I can't even say, the statute is the legislative rule of law given the force of given the force of law by the consent of the government. Very interesting statement to make. And I know a lot of you have sort of taken that statement and said to the police or courts and everything, I don't consent. The thing is, you have to look at the word. And this is what I didn't look at at turn. And there's, I'll give you another example of this as well. But I didn't look at the wording. Look at the wording. It says, by the consent of the government. You're not the government. You're the told. John Theresa May said last year <coughs> that um, we yeah. have a culture of policing in yeah, this country mate. by popular content. And yeah. she said that on video. Um, I forgot now what I was saying. Theresa May last year said on TV that we have a culture of policing in this country by popular consent. I don't know if anybody of you can remember that. But yeah, I think they all drive somewhere. So the governed have a choice of how they're governed. Yeah. You don't. That's what I picked up on. I suddenly realised we don't have a choice. We go, if you are fooled enough, I, I, I don't know if anyone in here um, sort of uh, is, is Republican. They, they, they look at the principles of republics and, think, and feel that a republic is a good idea. Well, republics are based on, the, are based on something that is, it, it's the Senate, it, it, it's the age old Senate. You've got two, so two houses and a Senate that are battle things. You know, Westminster is a Senate in all intents and purposes. And they battle things and they're meant to represent your wishes. So the idea, the objective, or well, the idea is you go to your MP, he takes your wishes and takes it to the House and has and the House talk it over and then they decide, yeah, that's actually a good idea or actually part of that's a good idea but not like this is how it should work. And the reason, and then, okay, yeah, this will be greater good of the people, on a whole, uh, will put this into place. And that makes that law a good law. Right? That's the process. That's what they said they created in 1256. That's what they said. That was the pretense of what they created. And it was done on the fact that, at that time, they were calling Henry III the spotted king. But, from what I can understand, and, uh, and, the, and the history, the, 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 what I've looked at, Henry III was far from a despotic king. He was actually very for his own people, and he was actually very disillusioned with such things as status and pomp and circumstance. He was very disillusioned, like his, his dad before. Unfortunately, his son was the one who created the hell, basically was instrumental in creating the hell that we live in, and it is hell. That's the history of history. <coughs> I'll explain a bit about that, because there's, there's a very, like I said, there's a story book that actually talks about things that have nothing to do when you die, it's actually why you're real. You just don't look at it the right way. And I don't read that book, I can't read it, don't make no sense to me, you might as well be writing fucking French, because it just it's making more sense, probably writing really French. Um, the governance, is that right? Who is it? Oh no, 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 no I'll be on there for hours. Yeah, answer it, yeah. Put it on silent. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to wish he had it. <laughs> <laughs> you think I can actually listen to that one? Um, I'm just going to try now. Where the hell was I? Distracted. Completely distracted. This is about distractions. This is what I'm saying about distractions. Um, hang on a third. Yeah, I was talking about it. Blah, 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 blah. Let me distract me. I was talking about it. Hey? Consent. Yeah, the consent. What I worked out is that the governed have a choice of how they govern, but the told don't have a choice. 
So, so the process is that you go to your MP. But you, if you do that, nine times out of ten, none, and it certainly ain't going to be put into power or put into force of law if it's a good thing for the people in general. Now, if, it's, if you come up with a great idea for the CEOs of the big companies to make more money, fuck me, they'll put it into law the next day. Okay, so the process doesn't work. And it's basically works on nepotism as well. All the elections, nepotism. If you actually look at it properly, there's a lot of nepotism going on. It's kind of keep it in the family. But the process could work properly. That's the most interesting part if the power base was changed. And I'll get back to that. Because that's going I, I, I don't want to give you this slightly yet. I just want you to see. I want to see if you can actually get this yourselves. Because it's very, very simple. Very, very simple indeed. So what I was looking at, I was looking at how law is constructed. What is the core of law? And the core of law is basically biblical. When you actually look at it properly, it's biblical. Um, and the actual structure works on the principle of a God complex. So there is someone, like I said, you live in a political regime, which is basically a political prison. You have to conform daily to the most ludicrous things even though some of the most ludicrous things that look ludicrous on the outside, if you actually turn it around and look at it differently, they actually do make sense. It's the fact that someone's making a lot of bucks on the backbone of it that is the wrong part of it. Like, I'll give you an example, right? Car parks, yes, obviously we need fucking car parks. Because I'll be quite honest with you, there are quite a few human beings kicking about who don't give a fuck where they park. They don't care, seriously. They will park in really, really dangerous positions. You know, and it, and it makes sense that you have car parts. I'm making free. Then everybody would use them. It's really simple. It, it basically equates, take money out of the equation, and it all works properly. Put money in it, and it's fucked. It's, it's common sense. You know, it's, it, it's not, this is not rocket science. And that's the point. They tried to make it look rocket science. I like watching the MPs on the television, and they're asked a question. I've been accused of this. But they ask a question. They'll give you five fucking paragraphs around the subject, but they'll never answer the fucking question. They will go off on everything, that, and they talk not to answer the question. When you take something down, I don't know, do you know how law is created? Private member bills, public member bills, do you know about this? That's how basically someone comes up with a suggestion. There are companies out there who do this for a living. They go down, they, you go to a company, there are specific ones in the city of London, and you suggest a new law, they will then go and present that in Parliament on your behalf. You have to pay, but that is, that's the, this is how it works. So you get private member bills, you get public member bills, and this is how, so they're introducing this stuff, then the two houses argue about it, and they seriously argue about it, and they throw free fucks into each other all the time. But when you understand the process and you've actually talked to these people and got them to talk about it off the record, which is very, very hard to do, I've only done it once. When you actually, when you listen to it, the majority of the House at the time always gets the result. Because if you, I don't know, do you, do you know what committees of selection are about? Or select committees, they call them, they're really called committees of selection. Have you ever heard this term? Right. When a bill's going through Parliament, and forget what a bill is and all the commercial stuff, the commercial redemption, all that rubbish. If you want to look at it and you, you're happy looking at it, crack on, right? But if you want to know the basis of this, the real nitty gritty, how this works. So a select committee, a bill comes through, and a number of MPs going, we don't like that part of the bill. So a select committee is formed, and a select committee is formed across the House. So if there's Liberal, Liberals, Labour and Conservatives, then the select committee is formed. That select committee, though, will be biased to the favour of the House at the time. So no matter what they talk about, the House majority is always going to get the verdict. It's called mob rule. Mob rule works on the principles of the Republic because if the Republic, the mob, are given the wrong idea and they vote for the wrong idea, the wrong idea goes through. Because it's mob rule. That's how that principle works. But it's the age old principle. If you, if you look at now, I would say we're in Cromwellian times. We're at the same times as what happened with Cromwell. And I don't know if you know the history of Cromwell. 
I, I, I like he's devoutly insane. This man was religiously crap. He was mad, absolutely loopy. <coughs> name of Oliver Williams, took um, his wife's name, hunted, uh, land over in Huntingdon to be able to get into Parliament, worked his way up through the army, blah, 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 blah went into the army and signed the death warrant of Charles I. Under a rump parliament, made up majority of his own men, are not really going to go against him, are they? If they know what's good for him. Charles I is beheaded, we enter into 11 years of the Republic. And it was completely fucked up. Completely. The fleet set sail and we set this model across the world. One of the most unique places it happened was America. Absolutely and unique. Because Americans only really have history from 1776 if you take the Native American history out of it. That's why they love English history, because we've got so much of it. But they haven't, they've only got 300 years or so. Not even that. So Cromwell Times. So what they set up is they set up a republic with a figurehead. That's they removed the figurehead, set the republic up. But as the process came through, they ended up with the same republic, but then with a figurehead. But the 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 way that they did it was to show that the figurehead had no power. And the weirdest thing is which my partner pointed out to me the other day, is that we had a beheaded queen on our money. Because she hasn't got a body, it's just a red. <coughs> it's called legal castration. It's very, very interesting how, how they did it. Um, and that, this started a long, long time ago. I'm talking sort of like 900 years ago. The monarch, a true monarch only has power through the people, and the people only have power through a true monarch. Now, whether you agree to this or not, at the end of the day, you come to listen to a viewpoint, an opinion. And it, this might be really, really something you don't want to listen to, but just hear me out, because you might find this fascinating. Monarchy means central point of administration of the law. Anarchy means non-central point of administration of the law. Two words that are completely confused. Monarch does not mean the king or queen, it means a central point of administrative law. But a true, the true monarch is bound by the same law. They don't just make laws and then they are immune from the laws, they are bound by the laws first. And that's the key to equality. It's the only way equality can exist. Now I'll tell you why I say this, I'm going to talk to you about an experience. For five years, for nearly six years, I've been experimenting with a website called TPUC that is called the People's United Community. It's not really a united community. It Far from it. It should be and it could be. Far from it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Now, I realised that I'd set up an experiment, and what I was experimenting against was a republic and a true king. Now I'll explain. The TPC is an experiment against republic in the, a republic against a true king. What one would work? So, TPC forum has 20, 25, I don't know how many, it's 25,000 members. There's probably only a few hardcore posters, you know, out of all that 20, most of them spammers trying to sell this shit. So let's say, well, I would say, let's say 100 out of that 25,000 are on the forum, posting, arguing, being childish, calling each other silly names, I'm just bad. Um, the moderators, as Ben, who's an admin, he's a big, uh, he basically looks after the forum. There's the other moderators, and I know I met one today, so I'm really pleased because I've never met him before. I'm glad he's there. I've uh, all expressed how they feel the forum should be. So this is your Senate, this is your arguments going across. How do we run the TPC? How do we keep it united? Blah, 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 blah. None of it fucking works. None of it. Every time they try, it just fucking explodes. And it's hilarious to watch. So, on the internet, I am a king. I am the king of TPC. It is my domain, my website, my kingdom. If you don't like it, fuck off. Because that's the rules. I am king. I pay for it. I pay for you to go on there and fucking slag me off. 
What sort of fucking idiot am I? But I am the king. And when I turn up on the website and you see an X appear, which is the mark of a slave, deliberately chosen, I use an X. I even sign things with an X. So fucking, I'm a slave. I'm quite happy to admit it. And I sign things with an X. It's just me taking the piss. When I turn up, Ben doesn't get emails saying I'm going to fuck your dog, or I'm going to come and shoot you, or I'm going to come and do whatever I'm going to do to you. And there is some really weird emails coming through. Just that one, funny enough, I'm getting, I'm getting to read it out. It's incredible some of the stuff that people muster to write down. I wonder if they would actually say the same to your face. That's a very interesting thing. But the point is, when I turn up and I'm doing my little bit, everybody seems to behave themselves for a while. So I've got, I've got a republic that is in chaos, then I have a king turn up, and it all goes okay for a while. Because I have a, a rules. I have certain rules in my forum, and my rules are, please remain polite and pleasant to each other as much as you possibly can. Please don't be to roll the tree or use the colour of people's skin or like any other physical ailment that you know against them. And all moderators must be impartial, which means if they answer a question within a thread, then they have forgo the right to moderate that thread. Because what we had was an instance where moderators were getting in arguments <laughs> and then using the power of being a moderator to win the argument by saying, ha ha, fuck off. <laughs> now I'm not having that. And we had a big incident with a friend of mine, and I went on there and said, right, if you're going to be this childish, which is quite detrimental to children, because children actually generally do behave better than fucking adults, and do you know every single child has you, your children have you wrapped around their finger. You only ever do what they want you to do. They are so clever. And six kids and four grandchildren, I've worked this one out now, but I watched my little granddaughter. She is, she is such a character in her own right. And it is. It's childishness. Absolute point blank childishness. I, adults result to just patheticness. So you have two, and I wrote an, I wrote an article recently and I was listing us and it upset for you people, which normally is the case, and access why I do it in the first place. I don't know if you've ever worked that one out. I wrote an alternative Jesus story just because I can write an alternative Jesus story. And I had an email come through from a bloke in Canada, and he says to me, if you were in Canada, you could be arrested and put in prison for this. I went, fucking hell, mate. Come on. I've wrote a fictitious story about a fictitious character in a fictitious book. I said, if I wrote one about Oliver and Charles Dickens, would I be, could you arrest me and put me in prison for that? I said, and if this is the case, then you better look at the foundation of your law, because it's fucked. It's really interesting because they, they don't like it. I wrote, I wrote the story about Jesus on my website is there for a very, very specific reason. Very specific indeed. But I do like getting up people's noses. Because you take notice, you take interest. And when you take interest, you look. And when you look, you find. And then you disappear down fucking rabbit holes. You might spend the rest of your fucking life down there. But you're interested, you're intrigued. And that's what this is about, it's creative. I want a light fire under your ass. I really do. I want a light fire under your ass, and I'm a patient enough man to wait until them flames lick up your arsehole and fire you into action. Because they will lick up your arsehole. Because I tell you what, if you, you think that's bad out there, oh boy, you wait and see what's coming. Seriously, you wait and see what's coming. If history is going to repeat itself, which it has done, Every hundred or so years, it comes round and round and round, then you wait for what's coming, because it's fascinating. And this will only get worse and worse and worse until one day you finally say, I have the power to change this. But not one of us can do this. It's going to take all of us to do this. All of us. Doing the simplest thing, which is even more funny about it. So TBC has proven to me, in a way virtually, that a true king could work. Now, how I've come to this more than anything is the fact that the whole core of the law system and the legal systems that we live in have the essence of a true core of power. The 
coin. It's not called HMRC or Home Majesty's <laughs> Prisons by mistake because it has to take its power from somewhere because it can't have power in its own right because, like it or not, the people of this island, the human beings on this island, call me are monarchists. And if you want evidence of this, go and look at history. Charles II came to the throne because of the people. They forced it. They forced it. That's the power you hold. You can change anything you want if you just grab onto the power inside of you and demand that that change has to be made. And in collect, why, why do you think they segregate us through religion, through nationality? Why do you think they segregate us? Because then you won't unite. They, we segregate through argument. I've got a golden rule with my friends. And he'll tell you this, he's a very dear friend of mine. My golden rule is, I agree to disagree. Because I will not allow friendship to be destroyed by a stupid fucking argument. And if it is destroyed by an argument, then it wasn't a friendship in the first place. It's that simple. He knows that. We disagree about a lot of things. He says I chat shit. <laughs> and many agree with me. But the thing is, what? Eh? Right. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm pretty to the moment. I'm the democracy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm fucking king. It's your call. 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 It's your It's your call. It's your call. <laughs> you can't do it, innit? I see you. It, it did, it, it did. Thank you. I am loving the fact you were listening. If you didn't listen, I'd win. Well, I don't know what we were talking about right now. It proved to me that that, and I learned at the core. So I said to myself, if you want to sort the problem out, then there's only one position that's got to change. That's it. One position changes, the whole problem's sorted instantly. Because everything takes its power from that position. And they have not got the bottle to take you into a fully fledged republic. Because they're fucking frightened of you. You do not know how frightening you lot are. Across the world we are renowned. Do you know why the Geneva Convention was created? Do you know why? It wasn't stop anybody else doing what they were doing. It was to stop us doing what we were doing. Because we had these tin pot riots a little while ago. And they were kids. Now replace them kids with pissed off, angry males. Seriously fucked off. Who have given up. They don't give a fuck about their own lives anymore. And they're going to take down <coughs> the ills. Then you have a serious problem on your hands. And they know this. They know that we outnumber them 400 to 1. This is a very, very powerful element. They are scared shitless of you. They make out, they created the world where you're scared of them, where the essence of it is, they're fucking petrified of you. Because if they weren't petrified of you, they wouldn't keep you in political fucking prisons. And after the break, I might tell you what you could do to change that situation. I might tell you. Dream was reality, and then you suddenly brought back into reality, the real reality. 
It's at that instance that suggestions can be implanted. A thing called Inception. I don't know, did you, any of you see the film Inception? Yeah. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? It's a very, very interesting idea. Obviously Inception is about ideas. The fact that you, could you do that? Could you actually give someone an idea that they thought was their own and actually work, and, and, and took the idea and actually worked with it even though they were actually given it? Absolutely, power of suggestion. All we do is, and we, we use the power of suggestion every single day. Every single day. We just don't realise how powerful what we're doing. And there is, I've spoken about this before, about the great, the great responsibility of the way we speak to each other. You know, we have a responsibility to speak to each other responsibly, decently, respectfully. You know? I don't always do it. I quite, I quite often, like I said in the morning, don't talk to me. Please don't talk to me. Um, and I will give you, you know, incidences of when I've, 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 I am, I am so bad. But it's the, the fact that I realise after. And that's the whole process that's gone on in me for the last five or six years, is the fact that I might say something and might not necessarily be absolutely factually correct in what I'm saying, but there is an essence to what I'm saying, and it's the essence I need. I mean, mate, you look so much like Gary Lineker. You really do. I'm looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry you do. Did you get that at all? Because you're yeah, really all the time. Like all all the time. You ain't got a bag of crisps in your head, have you? Well, maybe Gary Lineker looks like him. Yeah. <laughs> Very. Oh, dear. I was just distracting for a minute. I've got the lights and then you know it. There it is. Um, so, yeah, so, I kind of. A lot of the things that I, I you know, when I went at this head, head on, I went into it, law, legal, I'm going to beat you, you bastards, you ain't fucking doing this to me. And suddenly realised I was banging my head against the brick wall. When I looked at the, the allegory of the football pitch, you know, that you're, you've got this team and they've just got this massive team, little goal, you know, it's their ball, they make the rules up. And the rules are changed indiscriminately. And then you look at the, the processes at hand and say, well, I've got a problem with the Secretary of State. Can I actually sit down with the Secretary of State and have a chinwag with him? No. I've got a problem with David Cameron. Can I actually go to David Cameron or the Queen? Can I go to these people and actually express my problem? No. Why? Why can't I? I should be, allowed, I should be able to do this. Um, I'm being told I have to... Adhere to these rules, I have to do this on a daily basis, and even if I find that there is an aspect of it that I feel is in duplicity, that is corrupt, I cannot voice. And the only agencies that I can go through are members of the very same operation. It's like, come on, there's got to be something seriously wrong here. So, when I did It's an Illusion, there was, the essence was there, but some of the information was it wasn't right in a lot of ways. And I, would, I wanted, this is a lot of the reason I've come back out here to put this right now, because I was trying to fight things, law, 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 legal, legal, legal. And all the time I was trying to do it, I was distracting from the fact that I actually hold the power to do anything I want to. Anything I want to. And do I want to correct this situation? And why do I want to correct this situation? Do I want to correct this situation for myself? Is it a selfish need? Can I, through selfishness, selflessness um, actually create a selfless desire. Is there such a thing? Is it possible to do this? So I headed off into sort of like the spiritual realms and I even went into religion just to see what it was all about. Um, I wanted to find out what this attraction was to this thing I'd been, I was told about. I wanted to find out the attraction to everything. So I went in, so I literally lived these things, trying to live it, trying to go through it. What is my experience of it? I'm, I, I can't, I can read a book and it says this is all based on fact, but unless I was there at the time and I can confirm that everything there is in fact, how do I actually know it is fact? You know, I mean, we could all get together now, we could build a little lead time 
uh, time capsule. We could put any bollocks in it we wanted, any bollocks whatsoever, plant it in the ground, a thousand years it's dug up, a bit like the king in the car park, a thousand years it's dug up, history changes. But it's bollocks. We know it's bollocks. I've always had this image of two geezers walking away from Stonehenge, one with a pick on his shovel, or shoulder, one with a shovel on his shoulder, one looks to the other and goes, that'll fuck them up for thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't know, and that's the point. So, and, and, and law and legal systems are exactly bound by that. You know, yeah, you do what you feel is the right thing to do at any, any given time. That is your right. And no one can take that right away from you. And no one should try to take that right. No one should make a decision for you either. Make decisions yourself. And don't follow someone or, or, or follow their lead. Because inevitably you're being, you're being led down a garden path. If you're looking at political processes. If you want to break this into a nutshell, we've had 2,000 years, a little over 2,000 years, of religious and political processes which are joined at the hip, but one and the same. That's why they're called fucking ministers, and they go to work in a building that looks remarkably like a fucking cathedral. Yeah, you know, it's common sense. But we've had these processes at the helm of things for two, little over 2,000 years, and look at the fucking state we're in. Now, surely, surely, it is time to go it isn't working. We've got to redo this. We've got to come up with something that will work. That's all we've got to do. What are you going to give them? Another 10 years? Another 50 years? What? To do more of the same? Because they're stagnated. Belief is about, is, is a stagnation. Once you, you, you buy into the biblical story, that's it. That is the story. No other story. And if anyone argues with that story, you'll tear their fucking throat out. You, you, you won't accept another, and someone who comes along with logic, they literally come along with logic, and you will because you, no, no, that's the story. That's my belief, and I'm not having it broken. How dare you do that? How dare you fucking deny it? I deny it. I will not accept this. I will not accept it. I will not accept that humanity has to live this way. I will not accept it. From the very core of my being, I will not accept it. The only way that I can actually put it into some sort of sense, we're not human beings, we're beings playing at being human. That actually makes sense to me. Remember, I wasn't in a nut house. <laughs> I'm probably going back soon. <laughs> yeah, we can all. So I needed to come up with something that I could give to you, that you could use, that you could actually, and I needed to approach a subject that has been destroyed, deliberately been destroyed, because it is actually the only way that I can see that things can be sorted out. And I'm not saying I'm right, please do not take what I'm saying as being absolutely factual, because it's not, it's an idea, a notion, that's all it is. I can't, I can't say, yes, this is going to work. Of course I can't. I can't predict the future. You know, no one can. I'm sorry, this is not. Because the future is created in the very now. And someone might say, well, that's going to happen. I say, no, it fucking ain't, because I'm walking over here. Well, you're going to walk up, no, I'm not walking over here. The future changes in every blink of an eye. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> no, but do you see what I mean? So you can't predict what's going to happen. Yes, you can, set, you can set a suggestion, you can come up with an idea. Once upon a time, I'll give you an instance, right? Once upon a time, there was four blokes, or four ladies, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Sat, in, sat around, right now talking, and they lived in this equal community, and you did your day's work, and you got your food, and you had an house to live in, you wanted for nothing. There was no boss, there was nothing, you just lived in anarchy. Central point of administration, central point of administration of law, non-central point of administration of law is the anarchical side of it, but it also has a central point of administration of law, which is you. You are your central point of administration of law. Do you get, do you get what I'm saying? You decide what law you live under. You decide whether you're going to go, mate, you're a cunt, or you go, mate, I love you. That's your law. Granted? Right. 
So if you've got that law on side, so they're all sat there, got this law, but for some reason, one of them went, I'm not happy with this. I'm not. I'm fed up with having my equal share. I want a little bit more. How am I going to do it? Do you know what? I'm going to create this make-believe thing called God. And I'm going to say, I'm its servant. And because I'm its servant, I'm entitled to a little bit more. I'm going to sell this. This is, I can market this. And I can get right up the top of the ladder. And I can have loads more. Because I am the servant of this make-believe thing. So over the years, this, is, this concept comes into... And then a mother comes to him with her child and says, but you're taking the food from my child's mouth. But I am the servant. I'm entitled to this. Fuck your child. I want my cup. This is what I, I serve. You serve what? Some make-believe thing. It's not make-believe, it's real. Because I say to prove it's real. I can't prove it real. Well, you have to believe in it blindly. Thus is the creation of religion. Because it was an idea at one time. Someone had the idea and they went, I'm going to create religion. Like they did with the will. I'm going to create the will. Or I'm going to create a mobile phone. Or I'm going to choose to do talks. Or I'm going to choose to do this. These are all ideas. So it just didn't happen. So ideas live forever. You can create an idea that lives forever. And the idea I have has lived forever. But it's just something that we've been distracted from, we've been turned away from. When I came to Leicester years and years ago, there was actually someone here who was there. I can't remember, I spoke to you alone, I was probably pissed off over it. Back in Wales. When I came there, I explored the concept. I just said one word. I said, I actually, well, it was a few words, but I said, the coin. The abuse I got on that day was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. I let it die down and I never said another word. But I'm going to suggest something tonight because you, you are slightly in a different place. The Queen is seen as the essence of all power. Whether she is the essence of all power after being in the class straight, which I can prove within history, I don't want to have to do that, I don't feel the need to do that today. She's the essence of all power. Let's say for our sake, you could put, and unfortunately, as much as I would love the lady there, because you are wonderful creatures, you're mind-boggling, but you're wonderful creatures, you are definitely a different species, without a doubt. We are different species, without a doubt. We are. But it, much of it is a man's world. So it has to be a man to do the job that needs to be done. So we're talking about a king. So let's say you are going to say, you take history and you base... This is what we do. What we do is we look at history and then predict what's going to happen in the future based on what has happened in history, which directly affects via influence what is going to happen. It's, it's when you say presumption is the mother of all fuck-ups, it is. Because we presume just because something's been this way, we never see the other side of the coin that says, well, actually, it could do the opposite. So if you look back through history, you'll see certain kings and queens have done quite remarkable things, they've always been in the, in stooped into pomp and circumstance and status because they are the head of the status ladder. So not, none of them really did their job properly, but that doesn't mean that one day one of them could do their job properly if they come from us. One of us. Not someone who's lived their life in pomp and circumstance, but someone who has lived our lives who understands what we live and understands that, that all living things are on parity. They're equal. All living things are equal. How do you do it? How do you do that? How would you possibly have that position changed? How would you find who would be needed to take dictatorship, benign dictatorship of this country and 53 other countries directly and another 26 indirectly? It's a monumental task, monumental task, but not impossible, far from it. You've had, and your ancestors have had royalty forced on you, literally forced on you. You've never had a choice, ever. The only real choice that was ever made was Charles II, but that was for specific reasons. But you never had a choice. 
So what you do is, you place a king at that position. And that king says, right, well, we're going to have some new laws. One of the laws is, you've got to be polite to each other. You don't fucking laugh until you're arrested for not being polite. Another law is, I'm going to take from the rich and give to the poor until they meet in the middle. And we set a standard for everyone to live under. Everyone lives under the same standard. We take from the rich and we erase poverty worldwide. Because how do you erase poverty worldwide? You change their fucking governments. Because it's nothing to do with you giving them money. It's about their fucking government. If you can walk down a street in India and see people living in luxury and a fucking slum here and you can't see something wrong, then go and see a fucking head doctor. Seriously. Because we do this. We do this every single day. We are presented with this every single day. So that needs to change. What if we could create this? What if, he come, what if this man come along and said, you know what, public transport, when it should be public transport. Public, free of charge. Absolutely free of charge. Oh, well, there's not enough money. Oh, yeah, there is enough money when you take away all the quangos and the fucking hangers on and you take all the money out of the fat cat's fucking bank accounts and give it back to the people you fucking stole it from. You take the commercial world and you stick your right foot right up its fucking arse. As far as you can get it, twist it. This is always better to give it a little twist and then pull it out. <laughs> so you need a man who will do this. A man who holds it in his heart, seriously, to do this. To give back. To create law that they are bound by first. There is no privileges. There is no status. There is nothing, nothing above one line. And everyone is subjected to that line. Everybody. You want to drive around the roads? Yes, we need the roads to be of good condition. We do. We need the roads to be of good condition. But it must be worked out fairly how that can be done. And if you were asked, well, we actually need a pound off here to fix the roads, maintain the roads, and you can drive on. But we're going to take away road tax. I'm fucking sure all of you would give a pound a week rather than pay whatever you're paying for road tax. We need a health system. You know, okay, big farmer. We know what it's doing, I don't want to go into that, but we know what it's doing. So let's have the alternative alongside the conventional. And then sooner or later, people will start to move to the alternative because it actually fucking works. So you allow them to change, they will change. So you model this in that way. We need a fire service, we need the police on the streets, but we need the police on the streets as peacekeepers, not fucking revenue to uh, collectors or a private police force for the aristocracy to protect them when you fuckers find out what's been going on. <laughs> All these things. This is what a true king could do. He could really do this stuff. How do you do it? How do you get that true king? It's called, I used a word earlier. Does anyone remember the word I used? Dissolution. It's called being deposed. It's a very, very powerful aspect. It's only, it hasn't happened for about 600 years. But you can do this. The people can depose the monarchy. The second you depose the monarchy, her government has no power instantly. Her police force has no power instantly because their point of power has been removed. And if you replace it with your own king, then a new point of power makes them do what they fucking should be doing right now. It's that simple. It's really simple. Such a simple thing to do. How do you do it? How do you do it? What do you hold in your grasp that you can use by not doing anything? You're a consumer. And if you don't consume, they fall by the wayside. You could choose any corporation out there worldwide. And if the people of this world en masse went, fuck you. We're not buying your products. Mr. Coca-Cola would not be Mr. Coca-Cola anymore. Mr. Panasonic wouldn't be Mr. Panasonic anymore. None of that would exist. And you could do this. And all of a sudden, you're creating mass, mass problems for the governments because all of a sudden, they've got a lot of people hitting the streets that haven't got jobs. They've got to do something about that. Because they haven't got a duty of care. They've got to do something about it. What you're creating is an instance. It's like having a worldwide trade union. Worldwide trade union. It's 
It's very simple. And your demand at the end of it is that there is someone placed on that position to do the right thing by humanity. Do you know what the funny thing is? Christians have been talking about this for 2,000 years. Slightly differently. All the religions talk about it. What is, what is the myth and legend talk about it? The Arthur. What is the Arthur story? He's going to come back and save his people. Do you know one of the most powerful aspects of the Arthur story is a king married a servant. He destroyed class division. It's never talked about. All everybody talks about is pulling, st pulling a sword out of a stone and all the other bollocks and murder and fucking mystical and magical stuff. The real essence of it, he married a servant. He destroyed class division. Because you have to destroy class division for this to work. It's an idea. It's all I'm giving you. One idea. But in a few months' time, I'm going to give you a date. There'll be a date. That's all you're going to get is a date. And what I want you to do on that date, if you don't do a job that is very important, i.e. nurse or something like that, it has to be done. If you don't do a job, I want you to not go to work. I want you to seize this fucking place up. And I mean seize it. So they get a message in London. They get a very simple message. We will not tolerate this anymore. The people of this island have the power to change things. You have the energy to do this. You have the power within you. I will light a fire under your ass, and I will wait until it licks up your ass. Up. And when it does, you want to do something, we shall do it. I'm a very, very patient man. Very patient indeed. How have they took that belief off us in the first place? Or do we know we even have the power? Do you know what I mean that way? Distraction, distraction. Yeah, just distraction, mate. That's all that is. They've alluded to you, you have no power. They allude to you because you can't go and do something. They have vessels to soak up the anger. They're called political parties or churches or whatever you want to call it. You go to these places, you have a moan, and then you just walk away and you're happy. In the belief that something's going to change. What I want to give you is not a belief, not a fucking hope, something real to grasp. Something real. Don't have a faith in something that you cannot see exists. Have a faith in humanity itself. Reverse it. Know that we can do this. Be optimistic about it, not pessimistic. And it doesn't, we are one family. We are not called the human races, we're called the human fucking race for a reason. Because we're one family. And that whole family across the world can create a change that would go down in fucking history and then history could be eradicated. So our children can never suffer the shit that we've gone through. Because if they don't know it exists, it will never happen again. Ever. At the end of the day, it's just an idea. From a man who's a bit gobby. And was a resident on the psychiatric yeah, hospital. <laughs> and on that note, I'm shouting up. What's the date? After what the date is. Any questions at all? Any questions? Hands up, please. Oh, come on, there's got to be questions. There's got to be something. How old was you when you lost your virginity? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Can I say? I thought that's a bit of the other. Yeah, 13 or 14. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And her parents were no. driving the witches. Yeah. It didn't go down fucking well. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go down well, I promise you. I got in a lot of trouble. Ah, that's a good point. You, you've got to decide. You've got to find them. That would be very dangerous if I was in that position. I've got another how many people would it take to, to do that to, to produce position? I mean, obviously, the more, the better, but, but it's a very tricky thing to do. It's not, no, not. The, the, the point is, it's not, it's not tricky to do whatsoever, because <laughs> once they're, right, if you look at this logically, when Mr. MP sits at his table, then his food is there, and everything, all that stuff is delivered by us. Everything that he needs for his life to work, 
is delivered or done by us. We are the unwanted necessity. They don't clean their own fucking toilets. They don't do none of that. We do. We do all this stuff for them. So we stop doing this stuff. We literally stop doing it. We just say, no, do it yourself. And it's going to get to a stage where if you do this properly and it works out the way that I can see it could work out, you would cause this change in literally days. Because they can't suffer the effects of, you know, we've got a very, I'm, I'm suggesting something that is incredibly dangerous. Incredibly dangerous. If this goes the wrong way, we could end up with carnage. There could be bloodshed everywhere. If people take it into, and they'll do that, they'll do that to try and provoke you into doing it. That's what they do. That's why they create these tin bot riots and then you're meant to join it. <coughs> That's the whole objective, so they can come down in with you with even more force. That's why now there's, in London, I was recently, funny enough, we were down there and I recently got an email, they're now wardens dressed in green. What the wardens do, they walk around, if they see you doing something wrong, they find the place. They're getting kids to snitch on you. I don't know if you know about this at school, but you know, when they ask, they ask the kids questions about their parents. And some very, and we just recently, my son just done a project, and that was fucking nosy, that project. That was incredibly nosy. Yeah, they really wanted, it was citizenship. So what, what, what are you citizens of? A republic? This is what they're doing. You know, my, my, my son got called in because he was ill. He had a few days off. And he got, you got poor attendance. Your parents cannot ring you, ring the school now. They must get a doctor's certificate. I'm going up to school next week. I said, don't you fucking dare talk to my son like that because I'm responsible for him going to school, not him. So if you've got a beef about his attendance, you fucking see me. I won't say that like that. Very polite. But that's what I'm showing you how I feel about it. To a point, yeah, I, I, I can raise. But the majority of people seem to enjoy being a slave, though, you know what I mean? So I oh, I absolutely know. agree with you. So what you've got to do is wait for it to knock on their door. And it's coming. Yeah. It's people with wallets that seem to go on the street, but I seem to look down at the big people. You know? The thing is, what happens when, when uh, bedroom tax comes in? <laughs> See, the thing is, what, what people look at, and this is what I find most fascinating, they look at everything that's going on and go, oh, no, that's terrible, it's terrible. No, actually, it's really good. The reason it's really good is because the more that happens, the more they'll wake up. And the more that wake up, the more who are ready to do something about it. Oh, come on. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I know, I know. I, I live with that. I had, I've had so much impatience across my life, uh, through my life, but I found patience now. I found it. When I really needed it, I've got it. And I'm, I'm willing to wait. If you, I, I reckon, I give it a year. Right? Um, I've got this sort of friend that I know that was in the police force. Um, well, he's, not, he's not a friend anymore, but... That doesn't surprise me. No, no. <laughs> but basically, he, he told me um, a few weeks ago before I fell out with him, looking down as a guy, um, he's in touch with somebody from the police Federation, and they've actually told him that the police are actually training up already because they're predicting the riot. Yeah, they are. Because of this. Because of what's been. I will tell you the most funniest thing, right? I'm going to tell you something. Take from this what you will, alright? Just take from it what you will. You've heard about how they demonise things. Do you know, the classic example is cannabis, it's demonised. It's the age of, you know, this is good and the demon's bad, right? So they demonise it. Has anyone uh, watched the new Star Trek film, Trailer? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You like Trailer? I used to like Star Trek. And it's called Into Darkness, isn't it? Yeah. Very specific title, Into Darkness. And it's in the, 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 the plot is there's this big bad villain who takes down Starfleet from within, and then he ends up ruling the world. And guess what his name is? John Harrison. Out <laughs> <laughs> of all the names, they could have chosen. But that's what I'm trying to say.
say, it's like it's like a demonisation. They've demonised the name. So if someone you you, you go say, oh, I want to see this bloke. You fucking swear to God. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting what he says. His name's like, well, I'm not seeing no John Harris. I watched that film. He's a fucking bad guy. It's demonisation. You know, this is what they do. They, they're, they're very very clever at doing this. So, but the the worse things get, the more they will look to do something about it. And the more they look and they don't find any answers, as you, we've not found any answers over the last five years, especially trying to use lawful or legal, whatever you want to name it, processes. And then suddenly, someone comes along and says, well, actually, if you just do this, you'd be surprised what could happen. And they go, and they, well, do you know what? I've got nothing to lose. It can't get much worse. And it seriously can't get much worse. You know, I, I know, in, in retrospective here, compared to a lot of how, how a lot of people live in life, you know, we live a life of luxury, a lot of us. We have a warm house and food in our tummies. You know, we, we do. It is relative, you're absolutely tr tr true. But my point is this, is that is going to, you know, it's going to cost you more to eat your house. I, I'm quite happy, I would actually go, you know, when I, I've got so many, I come up with makeup ideas. You know, when I come up with a legal challenge once upon a time, I said, right, well, I reckon there's a bit, six billion of us on the planet, take that as a, a round figure. So there's six billion of us, so that means that I'm one, a one six billionth of the world population. Well, no one owns the world, so that means if they do own the world, then that means that all one billion, uh, sorry, uh, one six billion of us own the world equally, so that means that there is a one six billionth part of the world that's mine, and I want the fucker back. <laughs> So I'm going to go to court and say, right, well, if I don't own this piece of land, because you try and provide evidence that I'm wrong, if I don't, that means that an organisation, corporate or institution has stolen it from me. And I want it back, please. So it, it's ludicrous, but it's true. John, sorry, could we... Right, here's a little idea I had the other day that's kind of revolved the last couple of days. I've been doing a bit of work with this... Sorry. I've been doing a bit of work with the word dissolution uh, in other things and it's meant wonderful things to certain people and more meaningful things to me. Now people, uh, if I'm writing to an official body uh, under a dissolution, they basically have to campaign or protest against the solution to an address that I give. Um, now that's just on one subject, but what I did play around with the with was a bit of uh, idea with a couple of months ago was role playing basically, kings and queens around the table where basically we all, um, as a small community or a bigger one, we meet and form our own uh, king and, relative king and queenships over our families, and then basically you've got succession of kids, which are prince and princesses. Um, but uh, is there any way we could put a claim into somebody or some person uh, as, you know, as individuals and bigger groups to basically claim our royalty, because we're all crowned at birth, etc., etc., etc. Yeah. Um, but then all we, as individuals, but then form a bigger network. I see, I see what you mean. The unfortunate thing is that most of the processes that I talked about, and what I see is, is just another form of segregation. And it's what I'm trying to get around. This is segregation. You know, I don't want you to say, I am this, I am that. They've already got that. You know, Christians, Buddhists, blah, 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 blah. blah. So it's a segregation. Freeman was segregated. It's a segregation. You instantly segregate yourself from someone who doesn't hold your beliefs. Well, that's just the Christian going up against the Muslim. It's, there's no difference. What I, the idea I hold has no segregation in it because you're not labeling yourself anything whatsoever. All you're doing is expressing an idea. And we have the power of the internet. The internet is the most powerful tool humanity possesses. Because we can literally communicate a message virally in seconds. And I'll give you an example of this. Christmas Day, my phone goes, I've got an email. And I had an email from a man who lives in a cattle station in the outback of Australia, wishing me a very happy day and a happy new year. I don't know this man, never met him in my life, but he knows me. That's the parallel. In the outback of Australia, it's madness. Tell us about the story in Canada. Another one that we've done. Oh, oh no! 
in America. It's hilarious. It, that is one of the funniest things. A friend of mine moved from England to America. And he can't get residency, so he has to keep coming back and so forth. And he's bought a ranch, and it's in Michigan. Because it's near the Great Lakes. It's meant to be a really, really beautiful place. And it's all, obviously, all, it's quite spread about, all the places. It was New Year, and the town, the local town, invited everybody in, in, in a, well, it must have been a hell of a radius, but because... But anyway, to come to this New Year party. So Chris went there with his family. Funny thing, his, his wife is um, a cousin of um, Barack, uh, of, of Obama, which is even more comical. She is a direct cousin of um, the American president. Anyway, they go to this party, and he was in politics as well. They go to this party, and their little girl was playing with another little girl, and inevitably, Chris ended up talking to the little girl's dad and his mate. So they're asking where you're from. He said, yeah, I'm from England, blah, blah, I was into politics, said, but I've got this friend and I got talking to him and he sort of said, I sort of saw things differently, blah, 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 blah. They said, yeah, we've been watching this black guy in America, called, uh, guy in England called John Harris. Chris goes, for fuck's sake. <laughs> he said, I moved to the middle of America and they fucking know who you are. That's the parody. Now, we can take any idea that we decide. Let's say, let's decide today that BP, we're not going to buy fuel at BP. Alright? Let's decide that, right? And no matter how desperate you are for the fuel, go on, go on, you will get to another one. You will. So don't buy fuel at BP. Up to you, you don't have to do it if you want it. Social media says, I'm not buying a fuel at BP. I've had enough. Fuel prices must come down. Don't say any more. Power suggestion. Put an input. Job done. Social network, this is social network, that social, social network. What you'll see is, you'll suddenly see Facebook stop you from doing it. You've just changed the law. That's the power you hold. You see, so what we do is, we're already, I've talked to someone about this, and I know they already exist, we're going to create our own social <coughs> networks that can't be tampered with. We, all we do is we just keep doing this. We just keep doing it, and doing it, and doing it. And there is nothing, no one can stop this. This is it's called word of mouth. It's the most powerful thing human beings have. Spread across something that can get the message. You can get an email from thousands and thousands of miles away from a man I never ever met in my life, wishing me and my family Americans. That's what we hold in our grass. None of us realise it. So choose BP, fuck BP. Well, you can do Tesco's if you want. Choose a few of them if you want, it doesn't matter. But if you boycott them enough, they'll drop their prices to get you back. And when they drop their prices, you'll go back. But the others will drop their prices to compete. And don't stop at that. Don't stop. Keep doing it until fuel is at a rate you decide is right and not what they decide is right. And do it with everything. Anything, anything. Like have the idea. <coughs> Oh, Tesco's, I agree with that. I really do agree with that. Well, that's because they, they don't buy Walmart, so you can do it. You can do, look, the, the choice is yours. All you've got to do is put the message out there. It's not for me to put the message out there. I'll put my messages out there. I've sat here for three hours and told you my message. Shut up. John, <laughs> John yes. um, your theory about deposing the Queen Elizabeth and um, there is also Her Majesty in Right of England, which is the square mile. How do you propose them? What, to find the square mile? Yeah. Uh, because <laughs> that's really interesting. See, there's a treaty that is in place that actually gives the square mile its power, and no one knows about this. It's called the Treaty of Verona, signed by King John. Without that treaty, City of London has no power whatsoever. <coughs> You need, that treaty needs to be break. The second this line that is on the throne now, which is Swayer, it's not German, it's Swayer, it's Stuarts, they're Scottish. The second that line is removed from the throne, effectively that treaty is broken. And the second that treaty is broken, we can send the bulldozers into the city of London. How are they Scottish? How are they Scottish? The, what, the Queen? Yeah. Uh, the Queen's Scottish because 
Do you, do you really want to read this? Yeah, I'm uh, very interested. Okay. Um, <laughs> when James I came to the throne, it was James I of England, James VI of Scotland. Yeah. Um, Swain, yeah. Stuart. Okay? Yeah. Obviously, you had the periods, you had the Charles, the James, and you went all through the Mary period, Mary and William, they called him Dutchman, yeah. blah, 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 blah. I won't bore you with the details of that. But it basically ended up with Anne having 17 children that mysteriously died, so you yeah. never ever presented an heir. Yeah. The Act of Succession of 1702 says that the throne must go to the nearest Protestant heir. Now, the nearest Protestant heir to Anne was Electra Sophia of Hanover. And Electra Sophia, this is where the Hanoverian name comes from. Electra Sophia of Hanover had a son called George I. Yeah. This is when we first got our MP, uh, a, a Prime Minister. Lord of Shedwick, he became, and it was Walpole, if I remember rightly, I can't remember. Anyway, so, and when Anne died, it needed to go to the nearest Protestant heir, Electra Sophia of Hanover. Electra Sophia of Hanover had already died, so George I got the title. What no one knows is, and it's easy to look up, is that Electra Sophia of Hanover is the granddaughter of James I. So when she took the thing, and the line comes through the mother. So yeah, married in... The line changed again after George III because it went to uh, Victoria. Um, yeah, but it went through the mother. Victoria married Albert Sachs Goldberg and Gotha. He wasn't... He, the line married in. The line married in. The line comes through the mother and been maintained to Elizabeth II to this day. And that's the sacred family and that's why, you know, that's, the, that's when they created, what they needed, they needed a monarch that under the principle of divine right, thought they were a god. And that's what they got. And all they needed to do was castrate them enough not to be able to make or break treaties, because the city has no power without the Treaty of Verona. If you wanted to really do this legally, then you need a plantagenet. You need a direct descendant of John to do this properly, or a direct descendant of Innocent III. They're the only two who could actually really officially undo this treaty. We've just dug one up, haven't we? Yeah, Richard III. The reason this has come up because Plantagenet will start to be put out there, because it's a name that they want you to start to recognise. You've got to remember, both sides of the coin are played all the time. You're told the disinfo and the info at exactly the same time. Like, I watched a kids film recently, and it's called, um, oh, what's it called? The dude smashes things up. I can't remember his name. Becky Ralph. Right? Becky Ralph. Yeah, yeah. I watched it with my son. Fascinating. I loved it. Until the last word the princess said. I'm not going to be a princess. I'm going to create a democracy. I was like... There you go. This is what they're trying to teach the kids. The kids are getting this, aren't they? Oh yeah, don't need a princess. She, you know, she, we'll have a democracy and everyone can fucking argue. Mob can get the rule and, and status can be delivered, hierarchy and the whole fucking works. It's there. And that's, they, this is what they do. But at the same time, the principle was there for both sides of the coin. It's how you took it. And it's very interesting because my son watched it and we talked about that afterwards. My son switched on anyway, he poor little bugger. He's my son at the end of the day. <laughs> and it's the funny thing is, if this was down to anyone, I would say it's him. I would check, I, if, I, if someone said to me, who would you choose? I said, well, he's my son. Not because he's my son, but because of his nature. I actually went, took him to bed one night and I was, I'm going for a really, really bad spell. And I was sitting in the bed and I looked at him and I said, Do you know, if I can be half what you are, I'll be alright. And he said to me, Dad, that's going to be the other way around. I said, No, it's not, not in this instance. Because <laughs> he's just a perfect little fella, he really is. He's very switched on, very cleaned up, everybody loves him, he's got a beautiful nature. But my, my point is, <coughs> we can find, we can find someone to do this. And if they don't do the job properly, then <laughs> they just get fucked off and we find another one. But it's better than what we've got, because at least we get a choice. Don't have someone forced upon you, at least choose who they're going to be. You've always got a choice. <coughs> you say the same thing though, I mean, Herman Van Rompuy can just take control of our peace force right now if he wishes. And he's the President of the United States of Europe, so, you know, that he has that power. But we surely, you know, we, we take that back now. 
it doesn't make any difference because for me, the EU is the, the face of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church is the same as any religion. And, and I know we've got people of different faiths here, but I'm sorry, even Islamic, <coughs> Hindi, they're all Roman Catholics. I'm sorry. Well, if you if you yeah. look at if you if you just take what you just said, yeah. and you take that treaty, the second that treaty is broken, yeah. all power is gone. That treaty bound every man, woman, and child on this island to subservacy of the Roman Catholic Church through their king. That's what it bound. Yeah, but uh, there's a few people here who might agree with me. I don't know. Do we need hierarchy? Do we need a hierarchy? You're saying king, but I'm saying sacred feminine, making it woman. You know. It it would be it would be fantastic if we didn't live in a man's world. But we live in a man's world, and you need someone who has incredibly strong character and the strength to see this out, because inevitably they will become one of the most hated men on this planet. Because you don't realise a lot of the things that have to be taken away to correct the problems we're in. One of, one of the biggest things is what's been sold behind that bar. Yeah. You know, this is, you're not going to like this. There's a lot of things that have to be done. You need someone who's willing to stand and be counted and say, yeah, this needs to be done. I've just given you an idea. Now, you can be as pessimistic as you want about this idea, but the, the thing, what my process here is, is you will talk about this. That's the whole objective, to talk about it. And come to the come to your own realisation about it. Choosing the thing is the proper way to do it. And anyway, that's what the entry with health did it through like Jamie and Jamie and Jamie and Jamie. Someone said to me, you're absolutely right. Someone said to me outside, it's very, very interesting. There was a king once said, the king doesn't make the law, the law makes the king. And it's absolutely true. The people of this island have the power to do this. I'm talking about something that I could possibly... Years and years ago, I would have been putting the towel over the fucking head chopped off of this. Deposing a queen, deposing the royalty. Treason! I hear everybody going. Sedition. Well, it happens that most of the treason laws were removed in 1998 under Section 36.3 of the Crime and Disorder Act. And the law of sedition was removed about four years ago. So they're pretty much fucked. They can't do anything to me. I'll say what I want. So how many were it officially taken to declare... <coughs> Do you know, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't got a clue. We need to explore this stuff. We need to explore it. I don't know if everyone got the. You know, it's basically the argument is, is well, we're not doing this, and well, what, what will we do? Will you stick him on the front? And then we'll do it. It's, I don't know how it's going to come about. I know that. I know it is going to happen. I know you are, it's going to happen. I know that this is going to come about because it is the only way. It's a lovely sentiment to want to wake up in the morning and everything will be okay. Oh, yeah, that's a beautiful sentiment. I'd love it. Wake up tomorrow morning and everything is fine. Well, we live in a very practical and pragmatic world and we have to come up with a very practical and pragmatic solution. I, I have, sorry, one second. I have evidence of my own right that republics don't work. I have evidence that a true king does. I've done that myself just in the experiment. You've not seen that experiment, and whether you believe me or not, it's immaterial, it doesn't matter. I'm just giving you an idea. There's a lot of other ideas out there, there's a lot of people who come and do exactly what I'm doing, but I've listened to some of their ideas and gone, well, no, it doesn't make things any better for... I'm looking for sake to make things better for everyone, not just a core part or a select few. If you change the governance of this country, then that immediately changes 53 others. Not in a fortnight, then and there, on the spot. It changes. It's, that's why this island is so powerful. But you can't do that if that controlling element is, dealt by, is controlled by someone who have a little simple law that can't be undone because they've legally castrated the one who can undo it. But the Prime Minister is part of the very same club. He's the, he is a member of the club. So he's not going to do that. Otherwise. They're not going to allow it. They're not going to do it because what they require for their lives, they have agreed to do what they do for their privileges. And it's, 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 absolutely. What you need is someone, someone who doesn't want. Privileges, 
who wants to see everybody sorted out before he's, he, he's the last one. He's a servant. People don't serve him, he serves them. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just giving you an idea, seriously. I can already, it, it's, and you'll bounce this idea about. I'm a patient man, I've got to wait. I was thinking about patents, and you know how Nikolai Tesla invented, uh, invented stuff like free electricity, and I was wondering how we could overcome patents so that maybe we could use something like your website. Like people. Choose a fucking king, then you can own those patents. Yeah, and then we can, we can sort, of, <laughs> sort of change, change if you choose, our... If you choose a king, you can have free electricity in houses, clean running water for, the, for the most of the known world. You can have free electricity, you can have clean good food that's not been fucked about with. All of this can be done, but you need that power source to kill the commercial monster. Without killing that commercial monster, your free energy, my son, will just stay exactly where it we is. We need to make our own energy with like generators so then when we don't pay our electricity bills because we don't need their electricity. We need to make our own fuel so we don't need to buy our fuel off BP. But we haven't got the time to do that. Yeah. We haven't got the time to do that. So what we need to do is create a situation where everyone will get that anyway. Okay. Red diesel, whatever, it doesn't, it, this is, you're talking about symptoms and not the disease. If you want to correct the symptoms, you want the symptoms away, kill the disease. <coughs> it's that simple. When can we do it? Really, it's that simple. It's up to you. Yeah. I said I'm a patient man. I'll wait. <coughs> I really, I've got to buy you a packet of walkers. I really. <laughs> I'm sorry. And please, please go home with this thought. You have just listened to a mental patient. <laughs> An ex-mental patient. But I'm not mental, I'm fucking gargoyle.